Blair, good to see you. Hey folks, if it's okay, uh, thanks for showing up for the preliminary session. Now, all I know is this. Last year, I probably spent more time in the court systems than ever. I had to go through bankruptcy as a creditor, not a debtor, okay? Uh, I was sued by an attorney down in Aiken uh, to get a house back that I bought subject to. And on a personal level, our neighbor next to our house in Lexington, they have a, we have an issue with a tree. <coughs> the tree limb of theirs overhanging onto our yard. So uh, I figured since we are real estate investors and we do need attorneys, Midlands Rea is partnering up with Legal Shield. Um, so if it's okay, I'd like to yield the floor to Sarah Mitchell. You can um, cut it off even with your property line. It, well, actually, it's interesting you say that. Okay, I'll, I'll tell you afterwards more. I got some interesting insights about the whole tree thing. But, uh, anyway, so okay, I'd like to introduce Sarah Mitchell, and thank you all for coming out, and I hope she'll show you how to get affordable legal help, as well as identity theft protection, and all the low monthly fee, okay? But, uh, thanks, Sarah. Thank you, thank you, and I must say, I'm frazzled at the moment, okay? <laughs> at the restaurant, and boy, the slowest service ever. Uh, as a matter of fact, my food is in the car. I promise you, we're taking it out, but it'll be okay. I'm Sarah Mitchell, and I'm a Legal Shield Business Solution uh, consultant here in the uh, Columbia, South Carolina area. Also, I do field training and fast start training as well. So, uh, what I'd like to do is just share with you tonight uh, the services that I provide all over North America. And true story, as of today, I have protected three families: one in South Carolina, one in Georgia, and one in Maryland. So it just go to show how people, and all came by way of referrals. So I'm so glad to be a partner with Midlands Rhea. And this is an overview. I have a sign-in sheet. If you would like more information, I'll circulate that. And then you can uh, indicate name and number, email, and I'll make sure that we get more information to you. Um, basically, what we provide is solutions to two, issues that are truly in the marketplace. Would you agree that the need for legal access is not a luxury anymore, it's a necessity? 
based on the litigious society that we're in. Sure, sure, sure. Uh, that's it. And I re read an article um, this morning where they say it's a business. I mean, with people just suing, that's how many generate income from suing. And it's so sad, but that's just the way it is. Uh, identity theft, I won't talk a whole lot about that. But if you've not heard about it, we certainly will excuse you because it is the fastest growing crime in North America. And it has been the number one reported crime to the FTC for the last 17 years. Number one. That's how fast it is. And I will share with you a few uh, tips and what's going on here as it relates to uh, identity theft. So, first time using this pointer, which way did you say go, Bob? <laughs> I told you he's throwing me out to the wolves. Down. <coughs> Thank you. This is my demo group, okay? Thank you. But again, what we do in the marketplace, by the way, I've been with the company since 1998. I've had this service since 1998. And uh, of course, I started uh, just a little short story, one of many. But when I was introduced to this company by an attorney friend of mine, uh, we met at the Capital City Club downtown. I was going through a lot of issues. I don't know if you've ever had a situation where life was <coughs> life events, going through to the doctor, they don't know what's going on, you're being tested for this, being tested for that, and the insurance, the Blue Cross and Blue Shield, they're denying half of the claims. If, do you know anyone that has ever happened to? Not a good situation, especially when you don't know what's going on with you from a health standpoint. And as a result of this service and the attorneys intervening, they made Blue Cross and Blue Shield pay for many of the exploratory type testing that was denied. I was just so and convinced that I would have it the rest of my life. So I started there and have just used it, used it for the last 20 plus years. Um, so what we're doing, providing powerful benefits, protecting families and businesses, helping benefit professionals meet more needs. Uh, it, it may or may not be for you at the moment. However, you may know someone, a family member, or another business colleague who you can take this information to. I do a lot of speaking engagements. Any organization, any opportunity, I mean from church to in-home, if I can get the ears to share this information, I'm there. People say, well, Grace, Sarah, how, how, how large a group? I say, if I just get one person here and I can make a difference by educating that one person, I feel that I have done, you know, what I should have done, the right thing. So here again, as a business owner, how many business owners, entrepreneurs that we, do we have in the room? 99, 99.99, both hands going up. <laughs> and what, one thing about entrepreneurs, what do we do? I'm an entrepreneur myself. What do we do? Wear many hats, is that correct? Mm -hmm. And we're always out there helping and trying to make a difference, yet we can take, uh, a lot of individuals would take that good we're doing and turn around and invite us. So as a business owner, do any of you have employees? Okay, I see a few hands with employees. Um, are any of you in relationships where you're doing business with contractors? 1099. Absolutely, and that does happen with us as well because that's just, you can't wear all the hats, so you find someone else to handle this piece and that piece. Does that exempt you from their workmanship? <laughs> it's like, no, no, no. It does not. That's an extension of you. Therefore, it's so important to have in place and know the relationship just in case. How can you protect yourself? So I like to educate on that because sometimes people feel, well, I've handed off to Bob, the electrician. It's now Bob. That's your name going there along with Bob. Well, I didn't mean Bob back there. <laughs> I just used that name, but it's like, so it's an extension. So I want you to just think of this open, you know, just open your mind and think of the different possibilities. So as a business owner, have you, or those that you employ, ever had to fire or hire employees? It's a different day now when you terminate someone. Way back in 1990 or 1975, you could terminate someone, maybe even use some language that wasn't appropriate, but got away with it. 
nowadays people our ears are like antennas because it's lawsuit. So you can't you have to be careful with everything you say, you do, your action, your inaction, all of that. So how best to protect yourself and what you have worked for. Because when we go up what was that? And not only that, they got it on recording. You're so correct. And you don't, right away. Uh, that's it. So it's a different day. So have you ever had uh, issues collecting debt? You know, as a business owner, we know slow debt or no, we say slow pay or no pay can really cause you to be upside down depending on your cash flow. Am I correct? Yes. That hurts because as business owners, we're the last one to get paid anyway. <laughs> And when you have done provide service and now you're not even getting compensated timely, not a great situation. Yet we continue going about our business. So, you know, we'll help you with, show you how you can have help there. Have you ever been in a situation where you just thought the advice of a lawyer might be useful? Have you ever called that best friend? I know I'm Carol, when we go back our 60 years plus, we met in third third grade. And it's like when, when I'm young, you know how we practice law without going to USC or someplace? And it was like, okay, what you think about this? What you think about that? And Bob, hello, what happened? Is, did I take some time? No, the power went out. Oh, it's right outside. outside. Oh, in the hotel. <laughs> Okay, well, nothing you can do about that. But this is still on. Yeah, the power went out. Okay. Okay. Well, I'll just, um, yeah. But again, uh, when you talk with that best friend and they didn't practice, and as a result of that conversation, you go out and take action, it may not be the right action. Would you agree? Yeah. But yet we did it because what? Billable hours, how much it might cost, and you feel. This is the best we can do. We don't want to pay two or three hundred dollars for a consultation or for someone to review a contract or a document. So those decisions just take place. Um, moving right, I just go right from here. The next slide is saying um, small business facts. Uh, here it states that nearly 60% of small business owners had who said they experienced a legal event in the past two years did not seek legal counsel. Do you know anyone that experienced a legal issue in the last two years? that may not have seen legal counsel? <laughs> Billable hours. I mean, that's it. The TV is almost like a myth. You see these commercials. Oh, call the twos, call the nines, call whatever. But those are based on contingency type cases. When you have something that just relevant to your business, you're going to pay. They charge you for the call. They charge you for texting. They charge you for emailing. I know a lot of people say, oh, my attorney, they text me. You're paying for it. <laughs> they email me. You're paying for it. I mean, I have attorney friends, and a lot of consumers don't realize they're paying for those text messages and emails. So they think, oh, I have the best attorney in the world. You're paying for it. So again, we're just sharing with you how you can, OK, be enlightened and not have to worry about those costs. Now, this right here, you may not be able to see it very well from the back. However, Midlands Rhea, uh, we are happy, based on your feedback to us this afternoon, we are happy to provide you this chart. I'm just going to ask you as a business owner, just imagine, well, first of all, in the Columbia area with some of your personal dealings or dealings of others that you know, what are some of the rates for attorneys that you know uh, to review contracts? A couple hundred. Two hundred and fifty. To review a contract. Uh, consultation, and that's probably per, could be per hour, could be per hour depending on what the situation is. To handle a debt collection letter for you, write a debt collection letter, how much would they be charging our business entrepreneurs? Contract review, how much? Document review. Too much. Too, <laughs> too much. But these are things that we run into as entrepreneurs, am I correct? Yes. And sometimes it may be because of those 200, 300, we choose to go to Google, ATT Google. And now we're looking at what's online and 1-800-INDIA, what's, you know, what they're <coughs> saying. Those are not the best decisions, but we do that sometimes because of the cost. 
And that's where I love educating our business owners and entrepreneurs to say there is a better way, there is a guarantee way, and you don't have to worry about the risk factor. Because sometimes when you go to those sources, you don't really know who you're dealing with. If you do some real, real deep, deep research, a lot of those calls are going overseas and they are providing you information and content that you still would need to have an attorney review. So that's where we remove that. So just imagine, what if for just say $89 a month, because this is the most popular uh, uh, plan that we have with the greatest protection because of the trial defense. I don't know if you know, but trial defense attorneys and tax attorneys are the two most expensive attorneys in existence. So just imagine you went to the most prominent, prestigious law firm in South Carolina, and you said, for my company, I would like for you to provide me these particular services for as little as just at $89 a month, okay? We want a flat fee. Don't charge me extra. Whatever I ask for, you let me pay my $89 and you provide me those services. Got it? So if you went to them and you said, I just want you to provide me unlimited, at the moment, unlimited telephone consultations all month long, as many times as I call in for $89 a month, how many of you think would take you on as a client? Zero. <laughs> That's a big zero. None. And then you add, in addition to the telephone consultation, I want to have another authorized user or two, and I want you to provide me legal calls and letters. Just say, write 20 letters for me per year for that same $89. You think they're thinking you're a little bit more ridiculous now? In addition to that, you want them to review all of your documents most of them, because you're not that big, you're going to say you're not that big, but you're telling them, I want you to re review up to 30 documents a year for that same $89. Are they about to send you out of their office at this point? <laughs> Most likely. Now you're saying debt collection letters. I have problems with slow pay, no pay, all of that. I want you to provide me 10 debt collection letters per month for that same $89. You're sounding ridiculous to them at this point. Is that correct? <coughs> Trial defense. I want you to represent me in the event there is a lawsuit brought against me. Trial defense. Based on my business, there's a high risk. I want you to provide me 75 hours of trial defense time, knowing that normally your trial defense attorney is going to be several hundred dollars mm -hmm. for that same $89. 75 hours. So when someone come after you, it's almost like your attorney saying, well, my client has 75 hours already paid, prepaid. Go for it. I think that will deter some people. Don't you agree? When they have to pay 75 possibly to match your 75 out of their pocket, I think that changes some things. And then you're looking at contingency. So if you went and asked all for all of that for $89, I guarantee you, you, won't, you agree, you won't have any conversation after that with that particular attorney. They're escorting you out. This is, just to stay right there, this is what we provide our members. Is that huge or is that huge? That's huge. That is what we provide. That's why, yes sir. Sorry, I got a question. 25%, is that 25% off or 25% of the fee? Oh, no. Now that 25% is contingency, reduced contingency. That's getting where if not litigation brought against you, but now you're initiating a lawsuit and it could be bankruptcy and stuff like that, it falls into that category. But all, everything from child defense up is inclusive for $89 per month. The best write-off in the world. What you would pay for an entire year is less than what you would pay for about three hours of attorney time. That's why when our business owners and entrepreneurs see what we have, it is the most uh, economical way to protect your business. Uh, what are some of the things that you use attorneys for right now? What are some of the things that you use them for? Hmm? You don't? Okay, but if you could pick up the phone and not worry about billable hours, that would change things a lot of time. Corporate papers. Corporate papers. It's included. 
Anything else that you use? Contracts. Reviewing your contracts up to 15 pages. Not paying billable hours. Anything else? Entities. 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 Even before you start your business, consulting with the attorney. Do I go LLC? Am I going to be S Corporation? Is it sole proprietor? How do I best protect my assets? Do I need to look at a trust? Tell me, what do I do in this given situation? Too often, our business owners don't seek legal counsel on that very front end. And that is so huge. I've had business owners that have come to me that went into three and four year lease, office lease space, only to discover that they couldn't operate their business out of that space because of OSHA and other regulations. What if they had picked up the phone and called and spoken with their law firm? Now they're upset with the landlord. It's not their fault, <laughs> you know? But that's what we do on the front end so you can consult with individuals. I spent maybe most of my time on this piece because I think it's just so important for us as business owners to know that access does exist. And that is so huge. So what do we provide? Affordable access. We provide peace of mind, protection, and security to protect you and your business. So more information can be given there. Uh, do you know any business owners without a website? Here again, you can have a website for, this is almost like a writer. You can not only have a website for that small amount of $14.95, which is like a writer, but also you can have digital marketing dashboard, customer relation manager. How do you keep up with all that? Right there at your fingertips, where you can customize your website up to 15 to 20 pages for $14.95. Human resource document builder. <laughs> Human resource document builder. Online uh, training with Fran Tarkington out of Atlanta. I mean, business legal forms. When I tell you forms are there, forms are there. And now what you can do, some of the forms you can look at, oh, this I'm entering into a contract with the electrician to ensure that my best interest and my business is protected. I would just download this form, and then I'm going to go ahead and have it go to fact, uh, email it to my law firm, and now have them review it, and it's not costing me anything. They revise those forms and make them fit your needs and protect you. So that's just to give you an idea how that piece works. Uh, again, you have clients, people dealing with purchasing home, uh, dealing with divorce situations and all of that. So we have another piece, that's the business side. But in addition to the business, would you agree that you are the business? You're the business. So you protect your business for the $89. Now, where's your protection? Because when suits or anything happen, it happens to you as well. So here we have a family plan. Just imagine for as little as, and I've covered that, $24.95 a month. Just left Olive Garden. My, what, I got soup and, soup and salad. <laughs> plus soup and salad plus a tip. That's almost like half the price of a the cost of a, a membership for the family plan. That's what you're looking at. So just imagine for you and your family, do any of you have children under the age of 26? Yeah. Okay. Maybe a spouse or significant other. Okay. What if I told you for 83 cents a day, you can have the law firm provide you personal protection? Personal protection. What does that mean? If you have a business, when was the last time you updated your will? Because if you have a business, is that important? Yes. Is it important or is it important? It is truly. I have a case going on right now in, uh, what do you call it, Hard Dville? Is it Bad situation. Sister just died, was in a partnership with someone. All kind of fraud and everything right now is going on. And they just buried the sister last month. <coughs> That's what's going on didn't have all the paperwork and all the other stuff in place. Not good. So here again, looking at you, the you factor, what if you could have an umbrella of protection for you and your entire family for $24.95 a month? $25. What do you get for $25? How many of you can go in, you said some of you have children, even if you didn't have children, how many times can you dine out for $25? No. 
unless you're going to McDonald's. <laughs> but if you like me, we're taking my grands. I can't even go to McDonald's almost to taking the three of them because they want the supersized deal. It's like, excuse me, but that's just where it is. So I'll walk away from McDonald's saying, well, we could have gone to Lizzie Thicket and got a whole meal for that seven, six to seven dollars supersized. So, I mean, that's how we spend funds. So I'm just helping individuals and business owners to look at how can you redirect some of those funds and have that umbrella of protection around yourself. My husband and I, we love the Pizza Hut thin crust. Well, the one we buy is $19.73. That's almost a month worth of family plan coverage. And we eat out several times a week, just the two of us. So that's what you're looking at. So here, just imagine going to your law firm and for $24.95, they're going to provide you unlimited telephone consultation, personal. Contract review, personal. Document review, personal. Move in violation. What if I told you, uh, tell me, for those of us entrepreneurs, if our license was impact, would that affect us? Yes. What if you, we don't say go out and break the law and just speed, but would it give you peace of mind knowing that if you were to get a ticket or if that spouse or if that child, teenage driver, got a ticket, they could tap the app on their phone, take a picture of the ticket and go to the law firm and they call you within four hours to get details and work on negotiating your points. Where do I sign up? Uh, where do you sign up? Absolutely. <laughs> so that's what you're looking at there. I could go on and on. I, I can't even tell you all the stories. But that's what you're looking at. This is an app that you download for $24.95 a month on consultation, contract review, document review, a living will, last will and testament, health care, power of attorney, durable power of attorney, all of that, excuse me, right there at your fingertips. Emergency, if you're pulled over or accident or anything like that, all of that inclusive for $24.95. And of course here, like the business plan, if it's DUI, drug trafficking, contested divorce, anything like that, contested adoption, you can get a 25% discount. So limited time, we have a home business supplement writer, can talk with you more about that. Uh, we have a commercial driver's plan, can talk with you more about that. As I told you, identity theft is the fastest growing crime in the country, and we provide services to help you with that as well. So this is an overview, and what, what, what set us apart from other identity theft services in the marketplace is that we don't do just credit monitoring. We do complete restoration. That's the differentiator. Restoration, to restoring you back to pre-theft status. Medical theft, social security, DMV, criminal character, financial. That's what you're looking at. So I'm going to conclude with just saying, please um, get with me or get with Bob. We do have a sign-in sheet for anyone who would like more information, and um, we will promptly follow up with you and respond accordingly. If you like discounts like me, I'll show we showed members how to utilize the perks and what that means, your savings are so great until your membership literally can be at no cost uh, through your savings. So I'll conclude right there, Mr. Bob, and I thank you for your patience and your time. As I mentioned before, last year I probably spent more time in the court system than ever in my whole real estate investing career. So no one considers something like this very affordable. So uh, let's go to some deal presentations. Uh, does anyone have deals that would like to present for sale or tell us what you're looking for or maybe some success stories? Anyone? I'm looking for two owner financings. One, uh, both of them right around 100. One of them under 100, one of them over 100. But right in that area, if you know somebody who wants to, to do that. Uh, one of them could be a short term, and one of them could be the whole, the whole shooting match. Uh, we've got a uh, double wide out in Gaston. ARV on it's probably 80,000, and uh, we're showing it um, Sunday afternoon. If anybody's interested, uh, I'd love uh, for you to get in touch with me. I'll give you the information. 
And I've got two other coming out. One, I thought I was going to have contracts on them today, but they were supposed to be coming in today, but they haven't yet. Uh, if you're interested, then uh, uh, one of them's uh, going to be a buy and hold, and one of them's going to be a flip. Uh, you let me know, and I'll talk to you about them. Uh, I was reminded today uh, not to uh, talk about stuff you don't have under contract, because I, I saw something on one of the websites where somebody was advertising a piece of property for sale that we had been talking to the owner about. And I said, oh, you went with somebody else? He said, no, I hadn't signed a contract with anybody. I said, oh, well, there's somebody out there that's promoting your property and saying they've got a signable contract on it. So anyway, uh, got uh, two or three properties that uh, might be of interest to some folks. If you're looking for some properties, uh, well, let me know and I'll get the information to you. Thank you, Steve. Is there anyone else who uh, has a property they'd like to present for sale? Or tell us what you're looking for, maybe a success story. Come on up, Dan. Hey. Right, uh, first property I got, I got two of them uh, under contract today. Uh, this one's in 29203 on Wilkes Road. It's in the Opportunity Zone. This house, um, sorry. Uh, this house is pretty much move-in ready. The inside of it's all done. It just needs um, some appliances in the kitchen. It is going to need a new roof before long. They were renting it for 800 a month prior, and uh, we're asking 35 for it. Um, we're going to set up an inspection on it probably sometime next week, late next week. I haven't um, got the date set yet, but I'll be sending out uh, my email to the whole list, either tonight or tomorrow morning. So if, uh, if you're not on our list and you know want to get more information on it, by all means, uh, get with me here. I'll get your information, and um, so that way we can add you. You'll get the email, and you can also uh, go to our website, Midlands Investment Properties, to view it once I put it up there. Yeah. Uh, this one I also signed today. Uh, this one is definitely a turnkey rental, or it could be um, a rehab also. It's in the Shaladin neighborhood. This house is ready to go. It's just some minor cosmetics inside. It's already got hardwoods, granite countertops, everything in the kitchen. There's one room that um, they were building a new closet in. Just needs to finish being painted, and um, you know it'd be ready to put up for sale. Rent rates in that area are going 11 to 1200 for uh, that size house, and um, the most recent thing that's sold in there has been between a, around 115 to 120. So, um, very minor work that would have to go into this. It'd be a great, um, just easy flip for someone. So again, I'll be sending out an email on it tonight or tomorrow with a lot more pictures. If you like more information, feel free to get with. Yep. Okay, does anyone else have a property they'd like to come on up, <coughs> I'm sorry. I don't have any pictures of me right now, and I can't talk a lot under the weather, so my voice goes in and out. But I do have a property in the Forest Acres area. It's a 2 1, but it's already been turned into a 3 3 2. It's framed and everything. Uh, Master 55 is. It does need a total rehab, it's better out, so it's putting the wire, plumbing, uh, new HVAC. The roof is about five years old, so that, that's, that's, and it still looks good. Um, that's pretty much it, but I, I'm, I'm asking 55, taking any offers. So if you guys want to go look at it, let me know. I'll be sitting in the back. Actually, I think Brandon's buying it. Right? Call it. Yeah. What's the address? Oh, I'm sorry. Uh, it's 2820, 2822 Wesley Drive, Columbia. Do you have a flyer? Mm -hmm. Can I just ask everybody to scoot into the center so we can make room for more people to sit there? Except for around the camera, please. Where there's space to scoot over to the center. Hi all, uh, pleasure being here. My name is Brian Poirier. I'm a real estate agent from real estate uh, in Utah town, but I've been working in real estate investments for the last eight years in California. Uh, 
I've done over $200 million in transactions, mostly in multifamily space. Um, I have for you today a great duplex uh, rental, beautifully remodeled in Melrose Heights neighborhood, just a few minutes outside of Five Points. Uh, if anyone's a, uh, a buyer for this kind of asset. Sorry, go. Uh, if you are interested, though, feel free to talk to me after. Um, asking price is three hundred thousand. Current in place monthly rents twenty one fifty. Definitely some good upside on on the rents, though. That's all right. I also have a small uh, three-bedroom, two-bath home out of Rosewood, asking 145,000. Previous rents have been 1,400. Um, currently vacant, but we're thinking upside on the rent about 1,500. If anyone's looking for something like that, feel free to connect with me after. Thank you. You gave your contact information. Lori. My name is Brian Boyer. So I'm a real estate agent with uh, the Art of Real Estate. Everyone read that. I <laughs> uh, I'll, I'll give you guys my phone number eight if you want to wants eight zero three two five zero six eight six nine. What's your name? Brian. Brian Orange. Poirier. <laughs> <laughs> it's French, but I'm actually a little bit more Irish. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, yes. Valerie? Yes. Good evening. Good evening. Good evening. The, uh, what I have right here is a package deal for $140,000. Um, there's three rental properties together in the packet. Um, the owner is uh, willing to um, negotiate. So if anyone is interested, you see me. And at, at this time, I do have um, an offer right now. So I just want to make sure that you know what I have. Orangeburg, okay? And it's near South Carolina, like five or 10 minutes from um, Clapton, um, SC State. Okay, is there any other properties anyone wants to present for sale? Maybe tell us what you're looking for. Or uh, maybe success stories. Uh, we closed the deal with uh, Nigel Witherspoon today, a uh, wholesaler. Uh, so they, we got a good assignment on that. So um, we're a buyer in Columbia. If you don't know who I am, Brandon Barnes. Uh, my phone number is 843 990 3409. Um, find a handful flipping rentals, doing some owner finance, doing some different stuff. So, um, and then my email, which is probably easier than calling me, is uh, Brandon at INI homebuyers.com. You have something, JD? Sure. Why not? Tell us what you're looking for, something. Well, I'm looking to buy houses on JD Hollowfield with Mid State Property. Our logo looks like this. Right. Fancy hats that I just got in. Super excited about it. So now I'm a hat guy, I guess. <laughs> For the next like four days until my head falls off and sweat. And my head gets dirty and I'll be like, okay, get this. Um, anyway, we buy houses, we book a lot of houses. Uh, we're interested in pretty much any type of house. But, uh, oh, okay. uh, but we generally buy houses that are three twos and above. <coughs> Uh, generally within 30 minutes of Columbia, so we don't really do Orangeburg, sorry. Uh, we don't really do a lot of Newberry stuff, unless it's just like a great, amazing deal. Uh, my phone number is Party98. <laughs> if you spell it out, that's 803-727-8998. And you would think that I would have put forethought into this and given you guys, usually I give somebody like a tip on somebody that helps us rehab houses, uh, whether it's like an appliance person. I know people oftentimes 
called me. She thought I was lying to her. She called me for Mike, our guy at Best Buy that we get all our appliances from. And uh, Mike said, she texted him and was like, is JD messing with me or do you really exist? Can you really give me appliances? So yes, I do know people. I use, I use the hell out of it. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> Mike said that HB or uh, I and I has been really, really great. Probably twenty or thirty appliance packages from. Yeah, online. he's like, thank so you so much, dude. Yeah. So, like, Mike was my my roommate in college, so uh, if he didn't give me a good deal, then I'll just tell everybody what he did in college. <laughs> <laughs> uh, he doesn't remember, so I definitely hold the upper hand. Uh, but we have a lot of connections, so if you need, if you have any questions or whatever, we're happy to share that because a lot of people, even though we do use them for our flips, we do a, a high volume of flips. Uh, you know, they appreciate when we give them other clients. So I think we've shared a granite guy, a appliance guy, a roofing guy. Uh, we're getting a bunch of people, but we've shared somebody pretty much every month this month. So I'm running out of people to share with you guys because it really doesn't take that many people to rehab a house. So <laughs> uh, anyway, if you have any questions, talk to me after. What's your name? JD. <laughs> like John Deere. Her talks a lot. 727 <laughs> Okay, anyone else with a property they want to present for sale? Maybe tell us what you're looking for, or maybe a success story? Anybody? Are we done for the presentation part? Okay. Well, if it's okay, I'm going to give you the standard intro, and then if it's okay, we'll uh, have our expert panelists come up. other good RIAs in the area. In fact, we have a representatives from two really good RIAs here as well. So I want to check your views out as well. Okay. Okay, if you could, please silence your cell phones now. All right? uh, we have a rule. If your cell phone goes off and then five dollars we have an oops jar back and you got to put five dollars into it goes to charity at the end of the year. Okay, Dean Louisa shake that by the way, fifteen of those dollars actually came from me. <laughs> so yeah, please silence your phones now or unless you want to go into the chair. Now, we will capture photos and video, most likely just for social media purposes. Okay. And also replay purposes because you can't make a media. Liability disclosure. This is a big one, and this is actually why we partnered with Legal Shield. We, we're generally, well, I don't think Rich Bowman's here. Okay, yeah, none of us are licensed attorneys as far as I know. So anything you hear at this meeting is strictly personal experiences and whatnot. So, um, but again, this is why we're partnering with Legal Shield is to get more affordable legal protection and legal help out to people. Okay? <laughs> Somebody's got to come off at every one. So, always one, always one. So, if you, if you need an actual opinion as to whether or not anything here at this meeting is financially or legally sound, seek qualified help because I don't see anyone here who's licensed as an attorney or financial advisor. Okay, okay real goal for 2019. We're about, we're over halfway through the year. Now nationally, the success rate for anyone even doing a single deal, this is from the national speakers on contact with, only about 3% ever do a single deal. And I'd like to think here in Columbia it's a little bit higher, which I think is very low. Um, one thing I do want to caution you is the traveling gurus come to town and they want you to put on their credit cards expensive mentoring programs, so for example, $25,000. Oh, I'll take it back. You're our, our attorney here. I just got here. Okay. <laughs> Rich is an attorney, so anything he said now, you choose to accept any of your challenges. He can give legal advice. Okay. Anyone else here, as far as I know, can. All right. Um, anyway, be wary about the gurus who want you to put yourselves heavily into debt to get into their program. Because there's a 90 now, if you're like the national average, there's a 97% chance you're not even going to do a single deal, but you have all this debt to pay off. This is what I think. 
you can learn what you need for basic wholesaling or even rehabbing for free or at least a very low cost. <coughs> You know, build up, if you want to go into a coaching program, there's some good coaching programs out there, but earn the money first, so you don't have to go into debt for it. That's what I want. We have some members here who went into some of these coaching programs, and now they're struggling to put food on the table because that made payments to whoever, on the credit card or the companies or whatever. And our goal is, by the end of the year, to increase that success rate to at least 20% 20, 20 or more. Now, for the beginners, our job, I think, is to get you up and running as quickly as possible, independently of anyone else, even us, all right? So as much as we'd like to keep you as members, it'd be unfair to you to say you have to depend on us or anyone else for that matter. You, want, you should be able to move anywhere in the country and take at least the, generous, the general uh, principles of what you learned here and tweak it to wherever you move, say like Alaska or something like that, okay? So uh, that's our goal. We'd love to keep you here, but at the same time, we want to get you up and running independently. The advanced investors who do choose to stay with us, we want to try to provide the best continuing resources that we can. All right? And as I mentioned, there's good RIAs in the area. You don't have to necessarily come to this one. But uh, if you are here, glad to see you. Now, this is why I went to a presentation, and this is why I think there's a low success rate. When we do something in real estate investing, the way we do it, it's easy to do, but it's also easy to not do. Okay? And you can see here the difference between success and failures is actually a pretty fine line. And you can see over time, success and failure look very similar. Right? I think a lot of people just give up because they say, oh, this isn't working. Right? If you adapt and change to your markets and everything, it'll work. And for the people here who have done a single deal, and all of a sudden it's like pulling the cork out of the bottle and you come out, you know, has anyone experienced that? You do one deal and it's like, uh, oh, sorry. She's got purple hair, she's crazy there. <laughs> anyway, as soon as you do one deal, it's almost like pulling the cork out of the bottle, okay? But until then, you know, don't give up, don't give up hope or faith, okay? It will, this stuff will work if you stay with it long enough. Now, any good club or association, this one or any other one, should be able to provide an abundance of resources, good resources, not the crap they sell you like, you know, well, is Jamal here? Okay, is Jamal? Yes. Okay, you, we, we discussed some of the crap people sell. Yes. All right? yes. Also, a good association or any, any networking event will provide great networking. For example, every Wednesday morning, I like to go downtown to the Richmond Library, 9 to 10 a.m., 1 million cups. It's free, they give you coffee, donuts, and I meet some great people. Right. In fact, I meant Jacques right there. So anyway, also a good association or club will try to give you the best training possible as it works now. You know, what works best now might not work in a different market. And a good club or association will always seek to improve and adapt as well as learn and try to teach the best practices for what's working in the present markets. Right? Now what we do here is we give you national discounts to national vendors and supply houses in the members area, as well as discounts on Midlands Rio trains and workshops. And for the workshops that are strictly through Midlands Rio, not the outside speakers that come in, we try to give to the members for free. Right? Uh, Non-members, we do charge a you know, little bit of a, you know, kind of a token fee, if you will. Uh, no door for your general meetings. Access to members area with local cash buyers. Uh, right now we have over 50, it's like 54 or something, with their phone numbers, as well as close guidance for deals. All right. And frankly, I'll be honest with you, okay? This is why we have the experts tonight, okay? If you call me, I'll be glad to talk to you. And I can tell you what I would do on a deal and what I wouldn't do. All right. um, if anyone has suggestions on how to improve, you know, we're always looking for new new workshops new topics to cover, uh, as well as subgroups. For example, me and Louise is heading up what's called a hidden market subgroup. It's a structured drive for dollars. And we're trying to start a mortgage notes subgroup, right, things like that. We're, we're trying to add on as we go along. If nothing else, you should, you know, we are on all the major social medias. Um, Instagram, Facebook, Twitter, YouTube, LinkedIn. But if nothing else, go to this one here. This is our Facebook group for deal folks, right? 
is initially meant to match local bars and local lenders. It turned out to be more of a deal flipping group and looks pretty active. So you might want to consider going into this if you're not already in this. This is the cash buyers list. As we said. Every month I get one or two people saying, can you get to the cash buyers list? You have to log in. Okay? You're the members there, you have to log in, otherwise you're not going to see this drop down menu. You log in and you will see this drop down menu and then you can access the cash buyer as well as other benefits. Okay, annual membership. We ask $125 a year for a single and $200 a year for a couple. And now you can earn something called REA bucks for credit towards that. For example, if you refer uh, a first time guest here, you first time guest, you can, uh, you can take off five REA bucks off your membership as well as uh, that that person signs up. Oh, okay, thank you. Okay. And if, if that person that you refer over ends up buying a membership, then we give you another 20 for your box. <coughs> we also credit that towards membership, workshops, and whatnot. Okay. Um, a few announcements. Okay, Dean Louise, can you uh, announce the book corner thing? Oh, okay. <laughs> this is actually the real organizational brain. I'm going to put this organization all this together. Okay, first off, if um, you could pass this out. Anyone who did not already fill out a guest form, if you could please fill one out and pass the board. Can you pass the board? Thank you. If you filled one out, just pass the board to the next person and work their way up. Okay, so this month's book club is um, John Maxwell's Everyone Communicates, You Connect. It is an excellent book. If you ever have trouble with just connecting with people, and this is important with your sellers and your buyers, you need to be able to connect with them on a personal level. And this book helps you to understand what you might be doing wrong, how you can improve your connecting. It's not just talking. Just because you're talking to someone doesn't mean you're connecting with them. And it is an excellent, excellent book. Highly recommend it. Okay, the Palmetto Civitan Club. We have monthly meetings the first and third Tuesday of the month. At, currently, it's at the flight deck. Um, however, check with the Facebook group page to make sure they're still there because occasionally we move the meeting to another location. We are trying to raise money to open up a after school program for special needs children and neurally standard developed children so that they can integrate and learn to re interact with each other. Um, I have membership applications here. If anyone wants to have more information, would like to join us, find out more, please let me know. Um, we are also hosting a spaghetti supper Monday, September 30th. I have tickets. It's $10 a person. We have a family uh, ticket for $50. So bring your parents, bring your brother, sister, cousins, and get a mass uh, family ticket. It will be all-you-can-eat spaghetti, salad, and tea, and it is from 6.30 to 9 p.m. And come see me if you want tickets on September 30th, please. We really need your help. Okay, the family ticket, I would like to add. Okay, I have to add this here, because I was thinking to myself, how do I try to gain the system? I'd pay $50 and I'd take the whole front row there. Okay, it will all be family. Okay, so realistically, your parents and kids under 18 years old living at home. If you have 20 kids, that's fine. Okay, but it should be 18 and living at home. We have to limit that. So. Anything else? Oh, we will be having an oyster roast in November, November 3rd, so just keep that in mind. That will be $35 a ticket, and it will be in Lexington at the Hidden Tavern. And we'll talk about it at the next meeting. But just keep it in mind, November 3rd from 4 to 7. Okay, next, if I could just bring this up now. Next year, I'd like to keep the same room, because the folks here have been really good to us, and they take good care of us. 
The only thing is, is we can't meet every second Thursday consistently like we've been able to do this past year. Would anyone mind meeting on a Monday, a Monday evening? <coughs> What's the best day for you? Would Monday work? Now, I know Fridays would be out because, uh, you know, people want to party and whatnot. So, uh, Mondays are okay with everyone? <laughs> so, if that's the case, then starting next year, I'm going to set down the reservations for Mondays, okay? But I'll let you know which one. Okay, Mike Green's Technology Minute, all right? Uh, Permits.com. Okay, I don't know if it used to be called permitzone.com, but this is a way to put permits online as well as search for local permitting requirements. And you also get alerts on updates for the statuses of your permits. So my, the My Green Technology Center was actually given to us by West Columbia City Councilman Mike Green back there and said, why don't you put up a website, either free or very low cost, that might help people. So hopefully you can make, take advantage of this. Okay, now for the meetings. Um, I'll show you at the end where you can, you can take a picture of this or you don't have to. Okay, the Palmetto Real Estate Investors Network is another really good area. It's seasoned investors as well as uh, some lenders there. So if you can make these on every uh, third Tuesday of the month, uh, John Branham and Ken Holmes run this. Ken is, by the way, one of our panelists up here. But uh, it's, it's a more seasoned investors. So if you really want some serious experience and expertise, this is when you want to consider it. Now, Midlands Ria and Ladies of Justice Luncheon is every third Thursday of the month at Efo Brady's on Hard Scrabble Road. The Ladies of Justice um, event is uh, a branch off of Legal Shield. Okay, it's basically uh, it's, uh, promoting women, you know, law law enforcement women as well as. Uh, Legal help afford, affordable to you. So, and Sarah Mitchell back there runs that. Women in real estate. Is Stacy Pinkney here? I know. Okay. Stacy, can you tell us a little bit about women in real estate? Yes, I can. Um, women in real estate, we're just a local group of female investors that get together <laughs> once a month, um, every third Saturday at the Panera Bread on. Bower Parkway, which is up a Harvison. We get together and sometimes, um, you know, we'll talk about specific discussions, I mean, specific topics that wholesalers specifically are um, going through, but we open it up to any women that are interested in real estate, associated with real estate, if you have any services to offer us. It's just all about networking, growing, supporting each other, and it's really about just having that hands-on, step-by-step process to help new investors get deals done. So, um, all ladies are welcome. Okay, thank you, Stacey. Their next meeting is September 21st, Saturday, and our bread from 5 to 7 p.m. Okay, the Columbia Real Estate Investors Association, we actually have a, uh, did, did Keisha make it? Okay. We have two of the co-organizers here tonight on our panel as well, Rick Renner and D'Angelo Lasseter. Um, D'Angelo's right here. Oh, okay, okay. Um, can you say something about the area? Uh, I mistakenly, well, I'm Rick Renner, I mistakenly told somebody earlier that you met at Zorba's, that's incorrect. If you go to Zorba's, bring us some food. We'll be at the Grecian Gardens on 378 at uh, Lexington. And, uh, when you come in the door, you tell them what to do with the real estate meeting. They'll try to put you in there for the bridesmaid meeting and the birth announcement meeting. But don't fall for that. You just look for us. We're in one of the rooms that they rotate around. <coughs> Glad to have any of you come see us. Okay, they meet every fourth Thursday at the birth, and their next meeting is September 26th. Okay, there's a ladies' business networking lunch run by Deborah Wanger. Uh, I'll be here tonight. But that meets every last Friday of each month. That's not just real estate, that's women in business in general. Okay, so if you can spare a lunch hour, there's a really good experience in that. Deborah manages, I think it's over 80 mobile homes alone. So she, she's pretty, uh, she's got the war scars, you know, the scars to basically show you what she knows. And their next meeting is September 27th, Friday. Now, 
If you didn't get any pictures of this, if you go to our calendar of events, that tab up there, all of these events are on our calendar of events, as well as a description of them and where, they're, where and when they meet. Okay. And I also circled here. Remember I showed you that uh, Facebook group, for the deal flipping group? If you go to the web page, our web page, there's a link right there. So you didn't have to memorize that link. Just click that link to take you right to our Facebook page. You do have to have a Facebook account. Just go ahead and click it and join, and you'll be approved. You don't have to remember the association. Okay. Tonight we have a treat. I didn't think we'd be able to get all these experts at one place at one time. But uh, tonight we have Brandon Barnes, Ken Holmes, Keith, uh, Keisha can make it, D'Angela, D'Angela Lasker, Rick Renner, Adrian, Mark Morgan, and as I understand, Adrian, we want to sing up here. It's just Adrian. Oh, okay. <laughs> yeah. yeah, Mark. Mark is a uh, uh, more of a silent, <laughs> strong <laughs> silent. <laughs> um, Peter Shevitz. Okay, Peter's one of the best mortgage brokers in the area. Okay, if you're especially looking for bank loans or what, <coughs> I suggest you contact him first. If he can't get you that loan, chances are nobody else can. Um, but he's also a player in foreclosure sales. I think Lexington County, this past foreclosure sale, I think you bought three, if I recall. And I know you skated over to the Richard County one to check that one out, too. I don't know how many you bought there. This guy's also a cash buyer. He's somebody you might want to know. Right? Rick and Mickey Tang, okay, we've had some questions how to get into commercial real estate and stuff. But well, guess what? We have, this is, again, another treat. Rick and Mickey, uh, they started out with apartment buildings, I mean the big ones, like 70 units and more. And now, now they're into retail centers and whatnot, everywhere from Columbia all the way up to Greenville. So if you have commercial real estate questions, tonight's the night to ask them. I have some myself. But if you could, if the panelists, could you all come up here and maybe have a seat? If you could just kind of welcome them. You have to click that twice. <laughs> okay, well, if it's okay, I gave kind of an overview of um, what our panelists have all done, but uh, I can't tell you any better than them. But maybe each one of you could maybe introduce, you know, what you've done and what you're doing now. And uh, and if anyone would like, if you're allowed, if it's not a problem, even their contact information, you know, if we could maybe start off to say, say the left, Rick, you okay to go? Yeah, I'm okay. You what? <laughs> Again, I'm Rick Renner, uh, retail real estate agent in Columbia, uh, an investor. Reluctant landlord in <laughs> 2007. Had a couple perfect flips that became not perfect. Uh, the experience that you hear from me on that is worth this meeting, but you don't repeat that. Of course, you'd have to have bad financial conditions and bad judgment. I only had one out of two. Uh, I have investments in Ohio. I work for an Ohio firm of IT network admin, but I live here and I still keep in close contact with real experts. Glad for your time. Well. Thank you. If y'all don't mind, I'm going to sit down and leave the place. Um, I'm DeAngelo Lassiter. I'm a licensed broker. Um, I've been investing for about 24 years. Not good. The first 20. It's not good. <laughs> <laughs> if you want to know what to do wrong, what not to do, I said, I don't care. I'm going to better now, though. 
Um, I yes, own um, 15 rentals, so that's all I do now is just buy homes. Okay. Hi, um, my name is Mickey Tangri. That's my husband, Rick. We um, do commercial real estate now. Uh, we started off with um, a duplex which we got from our home equity line. So we built slowly from there, and then we had apartment complexes and all that. But we did that for a good 15 years. Um, but now we are into commercial real estate. We have shopping centers you know, around Columbia, Lexington, Spartanburg. So if anyone looking for a commercial space for lease, I'm going to go for that. Um, but we did things, you know, we learned things the hard way, whether it was residential or commercial. Uh, unfortunately, we didn't have a guru or this kind of great, you know, group to learn from, but we just learned as we went, and we did all right. Many mistakes. Many mistakes. <laughs> but glad to be here. Hi, I'm Adrian Morgan. Um, my husband kind of bailed on us tonight. That's okay. Public speaking is not his thing. It's all right. He still can answer questions, but he's just not, not comfortable in front of the group. Um, we started a company called Open Door Enterprises LLC back in 2008 in order to do flips. Sounded like a good idea at the time. Great time to pick them up. Not such a great time to sell them. So we have a couple of war stories that we could probably share with that. We became unintentional landlords as well um, due to some of that. So we've done a couple of flips, been a landlord for brief periods of time. Um, right now we focus on private lending. So. We typically make loans to people who buy and flip houses. I'm, I'm Ken Holmes. Um, I have been in real estate all my business life uh, since 1993. I started as an appraiser, um, then went into landlording, and eventually went into buying and fixing up and selling. I've done a little bit of everything. I've done, well, you name it. Lease option, owner finance, commercial development, new construction, I've, I've tried it all. Uh, what I focus on now mainly is uh, I try to be debt free, and so I, I want to run my, I run my flipping business with other people's money and not with banks, and for the last couple of years I've been focusing on self-storage facilities. Uh, if you run into those, let me know. I love, I love the storage business, uh, but um, I, I, I do some coaching for life now, but uh, that's, that's pretty much it right now. I do some rehabbing and, and I do the storage. That's my main focus right now. Well, hey everyone, I'm Peter Chevetz. I'm with Movement Mortgage. Um, I've been in lending here in Columbia with many different institutions since 2010. Um, also have an MBA in finance from Carolina and um, started a investing, flipping business with my business partner um, who's here, Thomas Webb. Um, right at a year ago, September last year, um, we've bought and sold about 17 homes since then. And um, you know, just <coughs> juggling both, learning like these folks certainly don't have near the experience of a lot of them. But looking forward to this time and honored to be on the panel this evening. Uh, my name is Brandon Barnes. I've been investing for just over three years. Uh, I got started in the hedge fund space with one of the local funds here in Columbia. Uh, a lot of do a ton of volume, made a lot of mistakes um, for sure. So we've been kind of on our own for almost two years now, year and a half. Uh, we do. Average volume, 100 to 150 transactions a year between flipping, wholesaling, uh, lease options, and, uh, and rentals. Yeah, so we have about 35 rentals uh, at the moment. And we buy in Columbia and Augusta, Georgia. So we have a common theme for while we're up here. Is we've all learned from mistakes and <laughs> have the ability to help y'all's curve not be there. That's it. So who wants to go first? Yeah. <laughs> Your turn. Questions? So any of you dealing in notes, either buying or selling? Notes, buying or selling? I own some notes, but I don't actively market or pursue mm -hmm. notes, so I don't flip notes. But I love notes as an investment. Mm -hmm. uh, Me too. I, I create them as we make loans. <clears throat> Um, but I typically don't sell them off or buy other ones from someone else. Yeah, same here. We, we create our own loans or we're starting to create our own notes, um, but we haven't actually purchased any kind of outside of, of buying the asset and creating the note ourselves. 
Department, we're very used to you. Sorry, what's the answer? That's the end of our presentation. <laughs> <laughs> Is there a specific thing about notes? Yeah. Is there? A, yeah. Excuse me. Is there something specific that you wanted to know about notes? Uh, so you know, I do some uh, some lending. You know, like Adrian, but my lending tends to be those flippers, so it's short term. You know, and so you, know, you have different risks in a long term. You know, you know, lending arrangement. So I was just kind of trying to understand that because. Have some interest in it, but I haven't. You have interest in lending long term? Yeah, and, and only those. Uh, I've, I've, you know, I haven't really explored that, so I was seeing uh, I mean, this panel who it might have done that. The benefit on the notes um, is you don't get the emails that your air conditioner went out today, and you have to go yeah. replace it. Um, and so we're we're transitioning a little bit from having just buy and holds to some some owner finance notes. Um, so it's a way to. <coughs> But on the other side, you don't get the appreciation and depreciation of the asset. Um, and so it's, it's a straight taxable kind of income there. But it's, so it's just kind of a balance on what you want, your risk tolerance and your, and your threshold there. And I think the key to any kind of good note is your underwriting to the person that you're creating the note for um, by finding out their credit scores and, and different things. Um, which Peter you know, more knows about just from the mortgage side. Because um, the better your note is underwritten and set up, the more marketable your note is for other people to buy your paper as well. The one advice I'll have with that would be, um, if you are doing a note for somebody, be prepared to take over the property. Like, if you are okay with taking over the property, just look at that the first thing. Um, <laughs> we have done some notes, some have been great, some have been like, we had to take back the property, and I right. really did not want that property back, but, you know. <laughs> so, so just be prepared, that good chance you might be, you might have to take over property sometimes. The way I look at it is if I have a note, I want the worst thing that could ever happen would be for them to make all their payments on time. Mm -hmm. Everything else would be more lucrative. That's the note I'll purchase. Mm -hmm. I don't purchase another note. Because I don't want to be scared. If they don't make the payment, I would like to smile. Because mm -hmm. I'm good with it. Mm -hmm. You know. And that's the note I will purchase. I would say to you, if it, it sounds like perhaps you have some money that you would like to invest long term, and I would think that rather than lending long term, that you would form relationships with people in this room or whatever room that got it going on and know what they're doing and work with them in an ownership capacity rather than a lending capacity. Uh, that would be the way I would go if I were you, if that makes sense. The other recommendation I have is there's a there's a notes group that's a subset of the Upstate Carolina Real Estate Investor Association that meets in Greenville, and um, so I know that they you know, they have a subgroup that meets once a month and they're actively learning from each other and I know there are at least a couple of people of that group that are creating notes for sale. Mm -hmm. So if you're interested, that's still in the state, um, might be worth exploring. There's gonna be one here soon. Yeah. Uh, Donna Bauer was here okay. three, three times, two times back. She's one of the experts out of Ohio. Just happened to be out of Ohio. Uh, and she got a foolproof system for 30 years back. In, but we'll have a, a subgroup like Bob said starting up here. And those want to get on the ground floor and learn. Not necessarily for me because I don't call like Ronald Reagan said, but there are just people that have excellent experience. <laughs> And there's one thing that we did with the, with the note is one time we were trying to sell a property and then no one was buying it. So we put a note on the property. We, we, we sold it as, you know, as seller financing and then we required almost no money down. And so that allowed us to sell the property and, and to get income. That actually worked out nicely for us. But if you can't, you know, if you can't sell a property, you can't rent it, then that could be an option for you. And there's other things with notes, uh, especially from the lending side and creating notes, you can, if, if you're buying notes at the right price, if you're partnering with them, you can do partials and regain capital and regain parts of capital and just sell, sell payments, um, which then can allow for some velocity there depending on how much capital you have to deploy. But again, it all goes to your underwriting of the person that's paying that service in the note. One thing is you try to sell the note, from what I've heard, I think is not true for every situation. But when you try to sell it, you generally get less than the, the note value. You've got to kind of bear that in mind. So try not to sell it. 
Well, there. Well, at least for me, I don't know about everybody. <laughs> well, there's starting to be um, a push. There's some guys out there teaching how to sell notes at the par level of the notes, and their big thing that they're kind of teaching and showing is it's all tied to underwriting, getting the service company in place. Like they're not going to buy some of the notes that we generally create in this room. You know, not the zero percent. Don't know who the person's paying it, and all these kind of different things. They don't want that paper. But if you, because because we just went through the process um, on a house we flipped, used our private money, had a note, and then went through their process, and then I'm going to go sell the note, and they offered us par for the note. And so I turned to get a cash out my private investor, and then written it for you know five years or ten years, something like that. So. I have a question for the couple with the commercial experience. Would you mind talking a little bit about the first big apartment complex you bought and like how you found it and how you paid for it, like how you financed it? Um, well, the first apartment complex we, we, we purchased was um, at the distressed property. It was a short sale situation. At that time, there were not many people interested in, in apartment complexes. It was in a, in a bad area. It was about 30% occupied. It was about 30% occupied. Mm -hmm. um, and um, what we did is, you know, we, we already had a lot of experience, so, so we knew we could do it. And so the banks were comfortable with us, and so we just got a traditional loan. For it. Mm -hmm. And, um, you know, if you're going to get an apartment complex, you, you definitely want to know that you could do it. Because. <laughs> It can go down very, very quickly. Very. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, you definitely want to have some experience with duplexes and managing first because it, it is a lot to, to, to do. What kind of uh, down payment did they require? Well, we had, we had um, in okay such financial situations, and we had to put down, I think, was it 25% or 30%? But normally, for a, situation, for a situation like that, you would have to get private money okay. if it's that kind of low occupied. Nowadays, banks don't lend for yes, the occupancy at all. Yes, yes, nowadays, they don't they, they, they need a lot of collateral. Or yeah, but nowadays, you pretty much can't get from what I mean. It's very hard to get out. So did y'all like, uh, yeah. did y'all fix it up? Did you have to fix it up? Yeah. And then that's, what it out? that's what we did. We yeah. fixed it up, we sold it 100% occupied. Now it's back to 30% since we sold it. So oh, wow. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Maybe we should buy it again. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that, that's the, uh, the, the play in the commercial, like they're saying, the banks don't like commercial property that's underperforming, and yet that's what we want. And so the play on that is to go in with private money, make the fix, then refi the expensive private money back out with a bank if, if you want to go you know, the, the lending route. But you won't be able to buy the killer, killer deal that's 25% occupied with a bank loan. I don't care how good it is, I don't care what the appraiser says, you ain't going to do it. You got to have money from some other source to get in. But if it's a year, 18 months, whatever, to get it running right, then it becomes a bankable property and you can make something happen. What was the experience leading up to being a resident? Well, I, I used to work a regular job, and we both used to work regular jobs, so I got tired of doing that. And so um, I, we did it at, during our lunchtime. And um, how we got financing for which I think is kind of a big over, over block is we, we used um, a home equity line. We paid down our house, we focused on doing that at the home equity line. We didn't have to depend on a bank. And once we got the experience, you know, then a bank would, get, would, would look at us. That was our first duplex with home equity line. And then we got a triplex, and we got eight units, and we got 30 units, and we got 72 units. You know, then it just flows up. And smart things to do in situations like this is when you have, I have no commercial or apartment building experience, and if I were to come across an 80 unit or 100 unit or something, I'm going to go to somebody who knows what they're doing and talk to them about partnering at it. Because it's different when you, you know, I own 35 rentals and one of them shits the bed. I sell that rental, it's out of my situation. Well, if you have two tenants to go or three tenants or something happens in an apartment building, you can't sell five apartments. You can't sell five <laughs> units if it's not a condo. And so, um, you know, don't try to be somebody that hasn't done a deal and then try to take on an 80 unit with renovation and, and stabilization and all those things. Give away equity for knowledge, and that's something I think people struggle with. Is they're like, I want to make all of it, and then you end up crashing and burning because you don't know what you're doing. Um, and I, I like, you know, we definitely do it on, on things. But when I learned how to flip, I gave equity to people to teach me how to flip, um, and those kind of pieces to help us get through that. 
So, so can you all talk about like, well, I got a question, like it's a two part question, kind of a motivational question, but at the end of the day, it's like, I know y'all started somewhere, you had to start somewhere. So when you first got to the point where you said, okay, haha, this is really working, to the point where you are now, like, what is the transition to say, okay, I'm going to actually assign the contract or I'm going to hold this property? I, I would say really good mentors. I mean, it's, it's echoing what a lot of folks up here said. Um, leaning on a community like this and talking through, brainstorming it with multiple people before you go in a certain direction and saying no dozens of times, you know, and, and just recounting that, following up, what hap whatever happened to that property, whatever happened to that deal, et cetera. Um, that's, I, I'm sure a lot of us would echo that. So you're asking how to make a decision with a particular deal, whether you want to wholesale it or whether you want to keep it? Yes, sir. Um, I'd feed my family first. Okay. Feed my family first. Uh, until you feel like you're in a really good place, mm -hmm. you don't need to keep a property because mm -hmm. A, B, and C could go wrong. And you might all of a sudden you got to write a check for seventy-five hundred dollars to fix that thing up, and your family's not eating. Uh, feed your family. Save over here for investment. When you feel like you're good, even if you can get in for no money down, you still need reserves. People who get into rental property without reserves, <coughs> that's who we buy from. <laughs> if you get into rental property, and you don't have, a, and I'm not talking about a thousand dollars, you need to have three or four thousand dollars per property until it winds up being like 12 or 15 grand that you can kind of let it go, or you're taking a chance, especially if you're borrowing money. Definitely. You know, when you borrow money, you sign two pieces of paper, a note and a mortgage in South Carolina. The mortgage says if you don't pay, they can take that house. <coughs> the note says you pledge everything you own in the world. Think about that. So just be careful out there. Everybody wants to get in the rental. Everybody wants passive income. <coughs> but it's not passive if you're broke. You can't afford to hit the fix the heat and air. You got 72 hours by law to do it. You be careful out there. Feed your family, save some money, have a little money up sitting to the side, then invest for the long term. That's my advice from doing it wrong. Because okay. <laughs> <laughs> no matter how much you think a deal is not going to go wrong, or this isn't going to happen. One of the first lease options I ever did, I think I'm out four or five thousand dollars currently right now. You know, thanks to Jesse for helping me start straightening some of this stuff out. But had I not had the ability to, because I bought it sub two, you know, had I not had the ability to make the mortgage payments and do some things that were needed, I would have disappointed the seller and I would have been in this huge um, other spot um, to take care of it. So to Ken's point, like, you know, until you're ready to take care of the problems that will arise, not can, will arise, um, you know, definitely be hesitant of, of keeping things um, on your own because they don't make it. One turn, one good turn if a tenant moves out is your year of cash flow right now. Easy. Uh, I have a question for Peter. You buy properties at the uh, county courts, a union partner. So when you buy the property and uh, it has, you know, asbestos, in it. How do you remediate that? What do you do to, to, uh, to make yeah, it all clear? I apologize to everybody, but my wife needs me, and I'm going home. So how do you remediate the asbestos and do you, do you um, call somebody in, do you yourself, and then do you disclose it to the, because you, you sell all of your property, right? you don't hold it, right? So you, what, do you, what do you do with that, That's uh, with asbestos especially? Yeah, so that, that would depend on the situation, just dependent on um, how severe it is, professionals, if, if necessary. Have you um, had any? Have you ever had any with uh, asbestos? Uh, in my personal properties, what, what are we... In your, when, you know, that you had purchased from the uh, counties that you had to remediate asbestos. Have you ever come across that in any of your properties that you purchased? It, it does happen occasionally, yes, sir. Yeah. Did so you what do you do to remediate it? It, it depends on the situation. We, we deal in a lot of properties. 
Um, I'm sure a lot of folks up here can say the same. Would, would you all add anything to that? We painted over it. Do what? We painted over it. Oh, painted over <laughs> I mean, there was some, as like 2% asbestos in the ceiling, the popcorn ceiling. I mean, you you know, you can take it out, but the, according to the EPA website, if you paint over it, you're good. So there is actually an EPA website on remediating um, asbestos. So it probably depends on what type it is and where it is. But this was on this was on the ceiling. Unless your kids climbed up there with a scraper and trying to lick the ceiling, you're probably not going to be in trouble. Okay, so I mean, realistically, that's that was one of the acceptable solutions. So, okay. I don't know if you guys want to speak to any of that. <laughs> but if you, if you try to flip that house and they come and do the, the inspection and you have to disclose the fact that it does have asbestos, can that affect the overall cost or the, the price of the property when you're selling? Well, once again, it was disclosed because that's how we discovered it, was that they sent an inspector in and they tested the popcorn ceiling. That's how I discovered it. But when you remediate it, we just painted it over. That The inspector said, okay. That's that's according to the EPA. That's an acceptable solution for that case. So yes. If you've never tested the property, you have no idea if it actually does have asbestos or not. It's all an assumption. Yeah. Once it's tested by a professional, then you have the disclosure issue. If you've never had it, have never had it tested, you just have an assumption it might be, and so you paint over it or cover over it or what have you, and it's and it's encapsulated by law. So, so it's no longer a threat. It's only a threat if it's airborne, anyway. Really. So. And then I have to vacuum. Oh. <laughs> I had a question. Um, for anybody with experience up there, I uh, know Brandon just mentioned some, some tools. Have you ever been in a situation where uh, you acquired a property subject to, um, but it was equity there? Um, what did you do to make it um, access that equity? Um, did you find a lender that was willing to take second? Did you find that comp? Access equity. So the house is worth 100. You bought it up to a 60 to 40k in equity. How did you get? How did you touch that equity? Um, I mean, you can refi it, but can't take it under a piece. I mean, or you can take a second on it. But a lot of people in seconds A are going to charge you a lot more money because their obviously their money's not as safe. But there's no real way to, to kind of tap into it. Um, I, don't, I don't think. <clears throat> and this is a uh, JD and I had a conversation just a moment ago about the same thing. If you're going to refi it, doing a, a conforming loan, um, you have to season it for six months. So you've got you got to sit on that for six months before you can put it out there. And the advice I had to him was take some time, rehab it, you know, get your tenants to love on it a little bit, whatever, um, and that way it'll it'll praise well and you'll be able to cash out in what exactly what he's saying. Yeah. Um. I think any of you can answer this question. Uh, going into investing, like, what did you guys' criteria look like on paper? Like the small multi-family investment, like coming up with a criteria, like sending out to uh, any business who's selling up. So like, typically, like the the, uh, the uh, deals that are going to be lower cap are going to be more safe. So I would, so we we try to do that first, like our first property to be lower cap, especially if you're looking for a rental. You know, in a nicer area that you know that could easily rent. So that would be the first one, and then we'll start going with, with higher cap if we got more experience. None of you guys would have to have like an example of a criteria you want to set out to. Uh, I guess that's like over time, you know what's a better deal, but. With it being lower cap means um, it's just uh, it's more secure. You know, it's occupied. If it's a good secure income, it's going to be lower cap rate. Cap rate is what we look at. Yeah, so we look at net income divided by purchase price. So it's just income minus expenses, including property tax. Um, but this includes federal taxes. It does not include that. And then we divide it by net income. And so the ones that are typically lower, lower risk would have a, a, a lower lower cap rate, so, you would, so I would first try one of those first if we're looking to get it to rentals. What okay. are you trying to do with the property? Uh, it's a buy and hold, but I didn't have a, I don't really have a criteria to say it, so I'm just kind of aimlessly looking. So you're trying to market to buy and hold? No, I'm trying to purchase a buy and hold property, but I don't have, you know, everybody keeps asking for it your criteria, what are, what are you looking for exactly? Mm -hmm. So that whole criteria question I get it all the time, wholesalers like, hey, what's your criteria? Mm -hmm. I mean, there, there's no, 
I mean, some people, I guess, when you get to a certain point, especially in commercial, you know, they want 10 caps, they want these kind of areas, they want these. Uh, but for, like the general investor in here, none of us really have like a true just box. We don't buy anything outside of it. Um, it's it's you know some people like two hundred dollars cash flow. Some like a hundred. Some like three hundred. Um, you know some people want to make twenty thousand dollars on flip. Some people want only seventy percent rule. Um, and I think one of the, the best ways to do it is look at it from a sense of what you think is a good investment, and then send it out to each buyer and have them um, you know assess it differently. But, but there's not. There, I don't I, like I don't have a criteria. Send me a house, and if I can make it work. To make money, I'll do the deal, you know, and that may involve me coming back through you and saying, "Hey, can you talk to a seller? Can we negotiate terms? Can we, can we do something different to make the deal work?" Um, and, and if you spend like your whole time looking for a criteria, you're never going to buy a house because no house has a criteria. I was just going to say, and I'm a little different um, than a lot of people. Um, I, I care. I do not care where the house is located because everybody has to have someone to stay. A lot of people won't buy 29203, I will. Because they have to have someone to stay. 29203, you'll find a house cheaper. And one thing, and with me, I only buy houses that are already tenant occupied. So I don't have that. <coughs> I don't buy anything that's, that's vacant. So when you're thinking about your criteria, and make sure that whatever the payment is, <coughs> if you don't have a tenant in there, you can still pay it. As he said, still feed your family. Mm -hmm. Don't get in. A lot of people want to go in and get $200,000 houses right off the rail. Mm -hmm. And they can't afford a $200,000 payment. Mm -hmm. And it's hard coming up with $1,300 when you don't miss two or three payments. Mm -hmm. So just start off slow. Don't try to you know, be the big fan. Criteria <laughs> <laughs> also depends on what you know. Because somebody who's very experienced might be able to flip a house and say thirteen thousand, because they know uh, how to do HVACs, they know how to do different things. Somebody who's not, they have to hire a contractor, so your price is going to be much higher. So it just depends on what you know and what's your how, like, how much can you fix it up. And like if you send me a house to flip, I've got a GC. GC's got to make money. He's got to do the renovation. So my renovation cost is different than if Peter goes in and swings a hammer. You don't want me swinging a hammer in your house. <laughs> so, um, you know, so when I come in and say it's a forty thousand dollar rehab, he may come in and say it's a twenty five thousand dollar rehab. It's the same house. It's the same reno. It's the same granite. It's the same cabinets. It's just based on kind of how things have to move around. And that's where, you know, people get stuck in this. Is like, what's your, what's a buyer's criteria? What's that? There's a buyer for everything. Mm -hmm. Every deal. Mm -hmm. If you're willing to like have good conversations with buyers and sellers can be structured into a deal. Whether it's a retail listing and saying, hey, listen, I have a retail partner that can put on the MLS and help you, whether it's an owner finance, whether it's um, a wholesale deal, a flip deal, a wholesale deal, like everything can be made um, into deals if you're willing to have good conversations. That doesn't mean chase every house, but if you have somebody with motivation, equity, and has the right to sell, and they're willing to work with you, like you can usually come up with some kind of structure. And that's where it's important to reach out to people and ask questions. I was going to say, if you're going to manage it yourself, you probably want to be pretty close to your house. <laughs> Honestly, because if you buy something across town, every time there's a phone call or you need to go see them for some reason or you need to try to go collect the rent, you got to go across town. So for me, I would say pick something fairly close to where you are. And then um, I want to warn everybody, I don't know if y'all are all aware, we may have talked about it before, the non-owner occupied property taxes in South Carolina are ridiculously high. It is extremely hard to make money as a landlord in this state because the same house in Friarsgate that I used to own and you know if it were owner occupied it was owner occupied when I bought it it was like $625 a year for taxes the first year I got the tax bill it was 2475 it was literally like four times higher as a non owner occupied rental so Build that into your into your finances when you plan for this, because the government's going to get their money. They don't, you know, they will take that house from you if you don't pay the, the taxes. So, and it's, they add on penalties and all that. So just be aware of that if you're buying a house in South Carolina as a rental, make sure you you can usually research it online 
and, and do a calculation of what that non-owner occupied tax rate is going to be, make sure you know what that number is and make sure the rent's going to support that. Mm -hmm. I have a follow-up question on property taxes. Oh. Um, and <laughs> <laughs> <they're> confusing. <laughs> So since I'm uh, new to the state and uh, I'm also an investor, I have my first duplex, I'm just curious uh, for anyone who's doing buy and hold, what kind of tips or tricks or any advice you have on you know appealing that down, because obviously it comes out to about 3% of value, and it kind of did my research as an agent, and seemed like some people were getting their assessed value even a couple years later, still lower than their original purchase price. So I don't know uh, if anyone has any advice on that. Have you, have you tried to file like for an ATI exemption? Do you, you know about that process? No. Uh, so if, if your um, purchase price is 75% um, it's 75%, so basically what you do is after you, after you buy a property and it's more than, than the previous assessed value, you can file for an ATI exemption. And it will go to, I believe I'm off the top of my head, like up to the 75% of your purchase price or the last appraisal value, the last taxable value, whichever is higher. So you, and all that is is just a simple form to fill in and just send it, and that's it. It's called the a ATI? Yeah, ATI. And then also when you get the property re um, to re reassessed this year, for all the Bridgeton counties doing that, you can uh, appeal those. And we won every single one of those. Carlos? Um, I guess the question for anybody that likes to answer, all of you guys, <coughs> you guys prefer to buy and hold and rent the properties out like single families or do you prefer to maybe own and finance them or what's your preference when it comes to that? In, in the state of South Carolina, I'm done holding rentals just because the taxes and every, I mean, because I kind of looked at the numbers for us, for us to hold a rental that I'm gonna like, it's a $1,200 a month plus rental, um, you know, with debt service and um, taxes and those kind of things. So for our side, we're, we're switching to creating notes and going to be doing owner, fi owner finance and uh, just true seller financing. I don't even know if everyone do these options. And then for Georgia, because we can buy the same asset in Georgia and pay 60% less taxes, um, and so it's a better better rental asset for us. I'd say diversification is good to think about, um, but it really just depends on where your strengths are. You know, if you if you're used to rent, managing properties and having tenants, etc. Um, as long as the money works, um, you know, don't be afraid to appeal your taxes and call around for insurance and, you know, talk, have a good relationship with the HOA and, you know, try to make sure that stays down, whatever. Um, but I'll agree with Brandon, especially with the market the way it is right now. I mean, selling properties is really the way to go, you know, because you can just move on to the next one. And, and you also, I mean, look at it from your tax burden as well. Um, I mean, the government gave us you know, some good stuff to become landlords over the next, well, I think we have three years left or something like that. And so, you know, if you do have the ability to buy and hold and you can cash flow and you can make money off of it and you are looking a way to offset um, your taxes at the end of the year with bonus, bonus depreciations and things like that, and you're planning on holding it for a certain amount of time, um, I think having a blend of all of it is really nice, which is nice because I can hold, I can get all my tax stuff done in Georgia and then come over to South Carolina and just look at pure cash flow. I think diversification is really good. You gotta prepare for a session coming up. You know, a few years the session is coming. Um, you'll be able to better survive with a rental because everybody needs housing. Especially in a session, people can't buy, so everybody's gonna rent. So, but housing, apartments, that's recession-proof industry. But if you have notes, a lot of people are gonna default on notes with uh, with recession coming up. So you just wanna have a balance of both, or be prepared for a session. That's very important. Um, yeah, because um, it's good you say that because I do here. Yeah, I have a duplex, and I also have a uh, few uh, single families that I bought something to. That the single families have decided to just do a wrap and just on the finance instead of wipe them out because the the profit, like the monthly profit, was about the same. And on the finance, I thought about I don't have to worry about fixing anything up or paying taxes or anything like that. Like property taxes or insurance, and you know, the tenant pays for that, and they get them with the same amount of, of profit a month. So that makes sense though, because in the, in the recession, I guess you would get more out of a rental. And I, and I think something smart to keep, you know, a lot of us look at our finance, and 
I want to get that 10% or I want to, I want to gouge the person living in the house. You know, that's the smart thing to do is like keep your stuff at an affordable rate. A note or a rent, nobody's going to default any differently if they can still afford it. Um, and so I know one of the things that we're looking at towards going to our seller financing is not, you know, we want to make, I want my note to be something that somebody doesn't want to go refinance. Because I don't know if you've amortized fifty thousand dollars over thirty years with interest. Mm -hmm. It's a hell of a lot more um, than what you're going to get on the rental side. Mm -hmm. And so, if I keep the interest to a point where they don't need to go to a bank, and I keep the the payments to where they don't have to go look for something else, um, you know, you have a better chance of keeping them in the house as well. Obviously, the cash has to make sense, but um, you know, don't don't go out thinking you got to get these predatory rates, and because then you you, know, you have Don Frank, you have all these other things you have to deal with. Uh, but be as close to a bank as you can to cash flow um, and make your money on the long term side of it. One thing I want to say about, about being in a recession, if we bought properties in 29, 203, and many other um, lower income areas, and those tend to be really good during the recession times. Mm -hmm. they, you know, there, was, there was a huge tenant market for it. We were well experienced and you know, we've been handled with the tenants. So that those tend to be really good during the recession for us. So I got a question for Brandon and the, anybody else that's doing seller financing. Are you just selling it outright, transferring the deed right away, or are you doing a bond for title type of thing? So we haven't. Um, I haven't done. So I bought my first house and I'm renovating it right now. It's gonna be the first one I've just done seller financing, and I'm using my my mentor to do it. So I'm not. I don't have an answer uh, for that. As I do a uh, land contract. Yeah. So it's. It's going to be it's going to be like a combination of land contracts and trusts, and there's going to be some a little bit more paperwork done. Well, the, the difference or, is just so people know the difference is if you're if you're selling it outright, then the title to the property <coughs> changes hands immediately right. now, and then you wait to receive those payments to satisfy the debt. If you do a it's called a bond for title or a land contract, basically um, they're going to make payments all along, but the title doesn't transfer until they make the last payment to you. So they can still they can still take that bond for title agreement to the county and apply for the owner occupied tax rate, which will get their property taxes down, put more money in your pocket. So if you can structure it that way, I would probably suggest that. Again, I'm not an attorney. Did not stay at a Holiday Inn Express, <laughs> but it did. You know, it did There's work out pretty well. Right there, which is said Rick on that. Plus, um, Rich. yeah, Rich. Well, plus, I mean, actually, when we, we did one of those, we did a bond for title arrangement, and the folks stopped paying, you know, because people stop paying sometimes. All I had to do was get them to sign another piece of paper that said, I'm just relinquishing the bond for title. I didn't have to foreclose and go through all that hassle. So, in my mind, it gives you a, a, an advantage in terms of the property tax hit and the simplicity of getting the house back if they'll cooperate to... And Give you that. But I may time. or may not have had that paper signed at closing before, too. Okay. Now, because I talked to you before, we're going through a foreclosure right now, yeah. and the person signed the last minute. Oh, they're pretty so screwed. We, so we, but, I, I, but I'm, I, I've definitely heard like both sides of it, but I've, I've definitely had that paper signed at closing, and then just kept it at my attorney's office. And then we just close it. It's like, hey, in this case, you disappear, and I can't find you. Um, you know, there's rules to it that don't be able to enforce it. Um, I don't know how much it hold up or never had to use it, but, but we, we've had the signs. What's the name of that, that method? It's called so bond, a bond for title or a land contract. Brandon. It's basically just two different terms for the same So how much down do you ask for your buyer when you do all the financing and if it's a hundred thousand dollar deal, I'm looking for a well qualified buyer with a large down payment. That's my marketing, and then we'll negotiate from there. Um, it depends on the asset. It depends on how much money I have in it. Um, it depends on what I'm trying to do with it. I mean, the house that we just bought for owner finance, it's a lower income house, so you know, probably five thousand would probably be a good number. Um, but I'm not going to ask for a number. I'm not going to, um, you know, because I I want. You know, I want us the best quality person. I'm not getting owner finance just so I can put somebody who can fog a mirror in a house. You know, I'll sit on it and wait for a, a more qualified person. Um, and so, depending on them, their situation, and their credit, and all those kind of things are all in it depends um, scenario. Because I've seen people put lots of money, 
down and walk away. I'm seeing people a little bit of money and walk away. Um, so. Can I clarify or ask a question about the owner financing? My understanding, owner financing only happens when the property is owned outright and there's no loan on it. But it sounds like it's happening. There's no way that everybody is buying these, all of these properties and owning them outright. So how is the owner financing happening when you have borrowed on a property or? What is that so, so owner financing, um, the only way for a like a seller to truly like create a, a note, there there can't be a mortgage there, and so when when there's a mortgage there, it's still seller financing, but it's a different tool they're using, which is subject to their existing mortgage. Um, for stuff like us, we are buying our house with cash, and so I do own it with somebody else's money. Um, <laughs> and, uh, but it, but but it's, who's letting you own or finance that you're borrowing? My private money. investors. Okay. It's conversations that we have. Okay. You know, because it's it's somebody who's willing to just kind of park their money for a couple of years, and yeah. we gave them very favorable terms. Um, but I cash them out a lot sooner than I cash the person living in the house out, and so it makes um, it makes a lot of sense for me. Mm -hmm. I actually had a bank loan on that house that um, that we sold on a bond for title. So we didn't disturb the underlying bank loan. Yeah. We asked the, the folks to make payments to us. We continue to make payments to the bank. There was no change of ownership, so the bank had no reason to call the loan due. And that's the way we took care of it. Were you still responsible for the taxes or with the new owner or the payer? Well, um, our bank that we had the loan with was escrowing for taxes and insurance. So they, they, the, the nice thing was when our buyer, our bond for title buyer, went to the county and said, hey, we're buying this property on a bond for title, the property taxes went down drastically. So there was an adjustment in how much we had to pay the bank on that underlying note every month. That was beautiful. Um, and like I said, that's how it puts more money in our pocket. <laughs> And what we continue to we we collected enough from the buyer to cover those property taxes and insurance that we still had to pay through our escrow account with the bank. So when they applied for the bonds for title or whatever, basically that lowered it to owner occupied owner. status, right? So basically, yep. you like went a quarter of your taxes. You know, you're paying. Okay. But you were still yes. the owner of record. Correct. Because Correct. Correct. Uh, with a bond for title, again, the deed doesn't change hands yeah. until the last payment is made. And you and you and but that one of the keys so like when you're passing through taxes and insurance you want to keep their rent payment their lease option payment whatever comparable to what a mortgage payment would be so yeah you're passing through your taxes and stuff but you don't if the house is traditionally going to have a mortgage payment of eight hundred dollars you don't want them to have an eight hundred dollar mortgage payment and the taxes and the insurance on top of that you want it to be relatable to what um, in a sense so that you can cash flow and then they can have a payment they can afford so they don't risk running into any issues at a later time. Just out of curiosity, did you explain that whole process to your tenants? Yes, I did. Awesome. I did, because actually the person I was doing this for was a, another real estate person and he totally understood. Yeah. Okay, so the, uh, the houses you guys are on the financing, uh, if an investor is purchasing this property from you guys, is it room for the investor to make his 100 to $200 or how, how, I'm trying to ask this question. Like, okay. You're trying to wholesale or underfinance? Well, no, uh, just buy and hold. Like, if I'm <coughs> financing a house from you, but I want to buy and hold, I want to purchase it from you, but off on the financing, would that be wrong for me? Oh, so you want to buy it from me on terms and then put a tenant in place to do them? Um, I mean, in my mind, I'm not leaving any meat on the bone. Um, I, have done, I have done scenarios where I bought. Um, I mean, yeah, I have done scenarios where I've bought houses and not done anything to them and then owner financed them to investors and then let them go do all the work where I've made like very, like I've got, like I have one right now, a guy pays me 175 bucks a month. It's not anything glamorous, it's not sexy, but I've been getting that check for a while now um, and it's really nice. But he did the renovation, he did, dealt with the tenant and then he, he'll own it at the end of the term. Um, but it was one that I didn't want to go in the neighborhood. I didn't want to be in the area. He loved it, and so we. So I do it for like certain people, um, and I made really good money on it. So I didn't have a problem. 
expertise and just focus on that because you know they say do what you're good at don't try to do too many things because then you're just gonna fall in between like we did apartments residential we just did that for the teachers and we were very very good at it we knew exactly what to do so now we do commercial so shopping centers in particular uh, so that's what we do I'm curious uh, that you with the shopping centers you know you read about how everybody's just buying stuff on Amazon now and there, there's not gonna be a need for shopping centers but then again, you're always going to have liquor stores and nail salons and stuff. Right. But what are you else thoughts as far as I mean, are you as far as your business and, and the way that the economy is more, everybody can just order stuff. You know? It's kind of a, 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 a delicate balance because you want to get a very good location, but you want to be able to charge less rents to the tenants, the commercial tenants. Because like 90% of our calls for a commercial place are people who want to spend a thousand dollars or less. But if the place is very expensive, then you can't do that. So you kind of have to find a place where you can charge low, you know, low rents mm -hmm. and have a great location that people want. Uh, and I mean, certain uh, things are always going to be like nail salons, you know, beauty stores, and um, they're always going to be retail. But you have to run the numbers to make sure. And be with, prepared for some vacancy. With yes. that, do y'all have anchors, anchor stores, or do y'all just have a whole bunch of... We don't do anchor stores, like uh, grocery stores, because we see so many grocery stores closing down. It's so scary, you know, for us, because if one grocery store go closes, all the other rounds start moving. So then you are with 20,000 square feet place, good, you know, you've only got 4,000 occupied. So it's very risky. Maybe the bigger, you know, bigger folks in this can afford that risk. You know, we're not quite there yet. Um, yeah, we do strip malls, you know, so it can be, we have a lot of like national tenants in there, but we have a lot of mom and pops, you know, they can easily turn around, it's easier to fill them in, but commercial is completely different ball game. Uh, we just learned um, the hard way, a lot of different things going into commercial, because we were used to a residential. You know, you can go in, fix up the whole thing, nobody cares, nobody questions. Commercial, you gotta get permit and you gotta be licensed. You gotta get really question you for the permits. Architectural drawings, engineer drawings, and a whole nine yards. I'm like, are you kidding me? We're coming from residential. You change the whole thing, and nobody. Yes, you know. and it's also much harder to get tenants for commercial. Much, much, much harder to get tenants for you. You would think that it's less work, better situation, but you have to have. Uh, you know, it's just much harder to get tenants. So Businesses not. fail a lot. How would you? So um, I wonder this. So we, we got our, our first kind of uh, office building last week or last year, not to purchase but to, to lease. And finding commercial real estate that is available to lease is the biggest pain in the ass that I've ever been through in my entire life. Is there any like tips or tricks? Man, we did LoopNet. I, I talked to realtors. Uh, but they were probably the worst realtors I've ever dealt with in my life. I, mean, I called every sign in Charleston looking for an office and nobody ever called me back. Um, is there any tips for people that want to have like office buildings or, or use that kind of stuff to find them? Well, we, and then I can reverse it and try to buy them too. <laughs> well, we, we, I think the key is to really be responsive. You know, uh, I get so many calls and you know, I'll answer them on the weekend, on the evenings and stuff. And the people will be like, I've been calling other agents for a week and nobody ever called That's, me back. I was on LoopNet um, just going down the list and not one agent called me back. Yeah. Right. I mean, yeah, for the commercial world, if you, if you list a property with an agent, like a lot of times what they'll want is they'll, they'll try to get TI incentive. So you're paying like eight months of TI incentive. Okay? And then after after paying eight months of TI incentive to get a, like, a good tenant, then you gotta pay property tax and insurance. So it's like for a whole year, you're not earning money for that one tenant. And yeah, first, uh, first one was like really crazy. We, yes. we hired an agent. We thought it would be great, reputable agent. Uh, he found us a tenant, he gave him so much TI, like to build, to throw new floorings, new uh, three months free rent, and then his commission check came out of $8,000. I'm like, it'll be a year before I see any of the money at all. So 
it's very different than commercial. And, and, that, and that's if they do anything. It's like 80% <laughs> of the time they don't do anything. They don't get. They don't answer the calls. Maybe. <laughs> yeah. 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 It's, it's yeah. very important to be able to answer the calls. And that's what we do. We are very accessible. You know, people can call us, text us. That's been a great thing that people can text me. Uh, so it's more. I'm more quick to response than they get from a lot of the bigger realtors. So, so if you want to get a commercial, I would say like buy something smaller that, that you can easily rent out for $1,000 or less, but it's still going to be a good amount of risk. You've got to be prepared for that. Is that Make sure that uh, banks, if you're in commercial business or real estate, that the banks, they don't really look at your personal credit as much as they look at the deal? Yes. And banks are not lending these days on commercial, especially if you got any vacancy or you don't have national tenants. They won't. They won't uh, give you a mortgage because they don't. Mom and pop, they don't consider too much. What high risk? Very high risk. What national tenants? What what? What are the national tenants? Something like T-Mobile, Dallas Free, so those are the national tenants because they have a corporate guarantee. When dealing with um, dealing with from your experience with pre foreclosure and foreclosures, do the homeowners just kind of like they rather take a bankruptcy rather than do a deal, or you kind of kind of just work with them, see what they want to do, or are they just trying to find a way to keep? Um, I guess the home just for no reason. It's so so you have some pretty professional uh, foreclosure people who uh, who definitely know the system, and so they would much rather uh, go that route and take your deal. I've had plenty of people when I talk to them like your house. I literally I'm, I'm going to go to the auction and buy your house, and uh, and they're like I'd rather burn in hell before I took your deal, and it's because they know how to game the system and live for free, and so. And I, what I've kind of found through doing my deals, there's there's multiple levels of motivation with certain people. And sometimes when there's like really high motivation to the sense of foreclosure, um, that kind of person doesn't even know how to get out of their own way. You know, all they're thinking about is how can I stretch this out? How can I live for free? How can I do certain things? And unless you can figure out a way to add more value to them in that sense, it doesn't really matter. And then you have people that are completely other spectrum that you can say, hey, I'll catch up your mortgage, I'll put you in a new place to live, uh, there's a couple grand out of my pocket, and then move out peacefully. Um, that is probably one of the most um, unique people that you buy a house from in my situation as a foreclosure, because everybody reacts to it differently. Because it's not just the foreclosure, it's generally their marriage, their family, their job. Like there are so many other things that are affecting them that cause them to go into foreclosure. We don't just wake up and say, hey, I'm not gonna make my mortgage payment today and live life and everything's happy. There's generally something else that's gonna layer on top of it. Is that a South Carolina thing or is that a nationwide thing as far as you just want to keep it until you to go to eight? So. Uh, I mean, I've bought houses in 17 different city cities over eight states and I've dealt with a ton of different people and uh, I've seen it all across the place. Um, to be honest with you, JD can probably speak to it because I know he's done it. Probably the best way to help foreclosure people is go knock on their door and talk to them. Because everybody's, everybody's sending them postcards, everybody's doing other kind of marketing stuff. And the few times that we did like true door knocking to foreclosure list, um, some of the best conversations we had were when we just were real with them and opened the door. And like you're the first person who's knocked on our door and genuinely tried to help. But I have 50 postcards sitting in my, um, or 800 text messages, or RBMs, or those kind of things. And so, but it is a brutal day. I mean, like when you want to when you want to door knock, it is a it is a it is a lot. Uh, you know, you got to be emotionally prepared for it. Um, you got to be physically prepared for it. You're in your car, walking. Um, but that's one of those things. Like if you're a low if you're a low budget, you're just starting, and people are like, how do I find a deal? Like, go knock on doors. Like that's that. And go talk to people. And then if you do come up to a situation and, and let's say cash is needed, you can come into the re and you say, hey guys, I have a deal. It's a foreclosure, but they need like eight grand and try to structure a deal. And if, if it makes sense, like that's where we come in and partner and and we have a lot of stuff. Yeah. When you knock on that door, how do you best? Introduce yourself without offending them. A lot of people in foreclosure don't really want to talk about it. So we always, uh, so we never, whenever, I mean, JD's done this 
much more professionally than I have. I just kind of did a beta test for a couple months. Um, we went looking not very professional, <coughs> t-shirt, kind of just normal, so we didn't look like a banker or anything. Um, and our, we always asked about other people's houses. Like my, what I've learned, the best way to get something that you want from somebody is to ask if they know somebody else that has it. Mm -hmm. You know, so if I want to go borrow money from Mike, I'm like, hey Mike, do you know anybody's got like 50 grand that I can borrow that I can go talk to? And, Mike, and then I, I, Mike's <laughs> going to be like, well, I want to make the money on the 50 grand. And so when we've knocked on doors, and our general um, kind of thought is, I knock on doors like, hey, I'm Brandon, uh, I'm looking to buy some houses in the area. I got one, two, three Main Street. Do you know? Do you know if they might be interested in selling, or I might can help them out with a foreclosure or something like that? Um, and we can drop some words, and then generally that person will come around and say, well, actually, you know, I, I might need some help. Um, and I found that the best way for raising private money, um, getting deals, is because people don't want to be called out. They don't want to be embarrassed. They don't want their pride or, um, you know, mess with. And so indirectly going through them to get what you're ultimately looking for. That's why I was thinking. When you guys started, uh, who raised, like, rent, particularly uh, what I've heard, you know, you bring in private investors. Do you have any resources that you have studied or, um, you know, to at the model how you want to do that? Or was it just a general, like, yeah, I know this guy who had built some report. I know he got 50,000 man around. Uh, the reason I asked is that, uh, so my brother and my sister called. And um, rule number one, I've been in business before prior to this. Rule number one is don't really do much business with family, you know. You know, you buy nice Christmas gifts, but you don't go into business with family. And they want me to move some money for them. And I'm going to say no. Um, but what's that model? Look like? I don't know, man. I disagree with that. I, I mean, I have family members that, that lend, um, but they've seen my track record. You know, they didn't. You know, I've, 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 last year, one of my private investors alone made $80,000 on me. And so my family members saw that and they're like, what the hell? And, and it's, um, and so, my first private loan deal, uh, it came from somebody that I didn't know had the money to do it, honestly. And, um, they called, they reached out to me. Um, and then since then, I've just started fostering relationships um, and, and talking to people and educating them. And, and one of the best ways that I've seen to raise private money is I show people what the hell I do. If any of you follow me on Facebook, B Barnes REI, um, I walk houses, I show them like renovation, I show them. Um, what our houses look like before and after and those kind of things and like, people message me and say hey you know how do I how do I become a part of that or how do I do a deal or I have 30 grand laying around um, and I borrow money from people in this room and uh, but what I say about at any time if you're gonna use OPM other people's money is that person is the most important person in any part of it it's not about you making money. It's not about the person in the house. It's about getting their money back to them. You know, and, that, and, I, and I've, I've, like, I'm in a situation right now where I had some properties that I was not able to do um, what I thought I was going to be able to do, and so I had to call them. And you know, we're going to get through the loan, but I called them. I was up front with them. I'm not hiding. And I'm like, hey, you know, we're gonna, we have to change our exit strategy on these properties, and so now, you know, I'm paying a penalty for it. But you know, they're the most important part. I don't care about me making any money on the deal at this point. I don't care about any of that stuff. It's getting their money back to them. And generally, you know, no matter what happens, you show good reputation and do it, they're going to come right back to you and, and want to work with you. And I asked because it came out of the room for me personally. Um, yeah. You know, um, they heard. And then just like you would say, hey, Mike, do you have any money? You know somebody with 50000 I probably borrowed. And it was like they kind of dropped those hints. So I picked up on it. And I was just like just curious, like, how did you set yourself up like, yo, this happened kind of bad? I wouldn't, I would feel hesitant if I haven't flipped or bought a rental with my family's money and I haven't done it. Like, I, I would feel a little, um, I would look more like an equity partnership with them and say, hey, listen, let's do this 50 50. Yeah, you're going to lose some of the money on it, but let them, let them be a part of it. Let them be part of the wins and the losses versus just saying, hey, here's 50 grand, go do something with it. Um, and, I, and I've done all of it. When I borrow private money, I borrow it straight cash, I borrow it in equity positions, I borrow it. Um, in different ways, depending on the relationship and the type of deal and things like that. Thank you. I do business with family too. I think it's fine. Yeah. I mean, we we have everything on paper. So if anything goes sideways, they've got you know, they got a right to sue me if they want to if I don't deliver and I don't perform. So yeah, we we document all. It's not not a handshake. You know, we we do all the necessary paperwork to make it happen. But I deal with family all the time. It's worked out great. 
one of my one of my funny joke, one of my family members that lent us some money on a deal. He's asking me, he's like, so if you don't pay me back, I get the house for this price. And I was like, yeah, the hell I'll go move there. You know, he was you know, but you know, and we and we disclose all of it. Like you know, the house, something can happen, you know, these things but you protect your investors, you use notes, you use mortgages, you make them loss pays on your insurance plan. Um, you give them updates on like, hey, this is what's going on. We, we bought it. We're at this stage of the reno. You know, we've we've got this going on, um, and just just be upfront with them about what's going what's going through. Um, what is the best way to get a cash buyer to this? You go to the Midlands Rena, and there's a cash buyer button, and you. <laughs> Um, so, so building a buyer's list, there's multitudes of different ways. You can do bandit signs, you can send mailers. Uh, my, me, personally, the best way to get a, the cash buyer's list to have, is to have a good deal. Mm -hmm. You post a good deal, and you know you have a good deal when people call you and want to come see it. If you post your deal and it's crickets, then there's, there's something there. Uh, because the market right now is too busy for a deal to just sit for no reason. Right. You know, and that's for the wholesales. Like, if you post a deal and nobody wants to come see it, don't think, hey, I have a great deal here. Maybe ask somebody, did I screw up? Is my price wrong? Did my advertise wrong? No. You know, should I not be trying to make thirty thousand this assignment when ten probably the right number? Yeah. Um, you know, and, that, and that's something to, to pay attention to is if, if you want to know the people who are buying, post good deals out there. I, if there's a good deal comes my way, you can ask any wholesale in this room. I reach out to them. If you do post like a deal that's you can great deal, is it better just to revamp huh? it? Admin. Before the 30 days or wait till the list of buyers? I don't know. I mean, can any. I mean, I don't know that if you post a deal as crickets that you're revamping is going to change it a whole lot because it's still the same deal. Um, I mean, somebody else might see it, some new HDTV flipper might want it. Like, you might get some like one off person that might, uh, might kind of deal with it. But, you know, I would reach out to somebody and say, hey, listen, here's what my numbers look like. Did I miss something here? You know, I have no problems calling Carlos and saying, "Hey, dude, I got this house at fifty grand. Did I screw up?" He's like, "No, I'm gonna pay fifty-two for it." You know, but like, like to me, numbers are just numbers. I don't care um, if somebody ever wants to call me and say, "Hey, this is the address, this is the numbers. Is it a good deal?" All right, cool. I'll pay seventy for it. If you get it below seventy, I'll pay you whatever you get under that. Um, and I've done it for multiple wholesalers in this room. Um, I think having that like scarcity mindset of not being able to reach out and talk to people is the wrong thing in this market. Um, but yeah, I personally think if your deal goes out and it's crickets, then something's wrong. Mm -hmm. Area, flood zone, price, condition, things like that. Um, because any cash buyer in here, I know we're not going to let a deal go to crickets. Mm -hmm. um, now we also try to look at the deals that come through specifically the Rio Money Mastermind group. Yeah. I know Brandon's on there all the time. I know I'm on there all the time. But I got other stuff to do besides sit there and stare at Facebook. I don't know if you guys do. Uh, if you send me emails, I get 4,000 emails. Half of them are in like Georgia and Montana. And I've emailed them a thousand times to take me off their stupid list because I don't buy there. Just because I'm a member of wholesaling houses full time does not mean that I need to see your deals in Montana. But uh, it helps to call. Yeah. Also, like, I mean, Brandon will call me, I'll call Brandon, whatever. If I got a wholesale deal or he's got a wholesale deal, like, hey, what do you think about this? Or, hey, did you see that email I sent you? A lot of people call me all the time yeah. and say, hey, did you, the people that I actually buy houses from, Ted calls me. Ted calls <laughs> me and says, hey, JD, I sent you an email on this. Or, hey, I'm about to send you an email on this. I think it's a property you'll like. And he also knows that I'll go look at the property, I'll tell him what I think my rehab numbers are, like Brandon said earlier, and I'll tell him what I'll pay for it, just like Brandon said. We both do that. I mean, I'll give you an offer, this is what I'll pay for it, here's my numbers, here's my ARV, whether or not you agree with it, here's where I got it, this is where I got it from, and step you through the process. So if you have a crap deal, it'll be self-evident with my numbers or Brandon's numbers or any rehabber's numbers. So. And then you shouldn't you shouldn't necessarily have crickets because there's a lot of morons on, on Facebook and somebody's going to try to date to change your deal, which is not totally cool, by the way. So while we're on that topic, date to change a deal is somebody else has a deal and you're like, you know what, I'm going to 
act like a buyer, and then I'm going to market it to my buyers list without letting them know. Yeah. That's the day's yeah, the deal. The other buyer markets it to more buyers. Yeah, yeah, and then that buyer markets it to more buyers and more buyers, and by the time you're done with it, you don't know who actually has the contract, the ink on the paper, with the homeowner. Because you, I've received multiple emails on a single property from multiple people that do not work together. And I call the first, the lowest price one is usually the dead giveaway. So the lowest price one probably has it directly with the seller. I call them and say, hey, are you aware that other people are sending out your deal? They're like, no. Now, sometimes we do partner with people. We partnered with Carlos before. I said, hey, man, I got this house. I know you got a buyer. He goes, yeah, let me show it. I said, cool. Well, look, I got it at this price. Let's flip the fee. But while I'm on that topic. I do have a question as well. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, but yeah, boys. I want to know, like, what's the steps we take to take residential property and try to get into, like, commercial property? Like, it's like, say if you have a house that you're actually renting out to somebody, and besides, like, a storefront, I have multiple people wanting to, like, rent out. I guess they want to have, like, a bonding company, whatever there, or a restaurant, whatever. But how do you get it from the zoning, from like wherever you're staying? Lexington, more, more so, but how do you get it turned over to being commercial? You can definitely apply to county to get it rezoned. If you have a property that is like storefront, mm -hmm. was a house, there are many, many properties that have been rezoned. So right. that's something you apply with the county, and they'll come and they'll post uh, notices that, you know, public rezoning notice that if somebody has objection, they should come out and all that. So there's a process, county does that, but it is certainly there. Okay. And if you can't convert it to commercial, you'll make good money on it. Uh, yeah. <laughs> Sometimes you're surprised if you're, if you're in an area with that's mixed already and you're near another commercial property, you may already be zoned for mixed use. I had a friend who was trying to sell his aunt's house, he didn't even know, but it was zoned for mixed use. Okay. Thank you. My question was uh, just to take a public poll. If you have a house under contract as a wholesaler and you accept an offer from a buyer, and another buyer comes along with a higher price. What do you do? Higher price. Go with the go with the original person. Integrity. This is the one person. No, it's an it's. I had this happen to me. I think it's integrity. You go with the person. Then also, we keep the back of offer. If they give you a hard time, then just go on. Yeah. But if you have a hard time, stick with it. Stick with it, but you don't have to deal with them too much if you got them. They said stick with the first one. Jenny, I'm glad you took my payment. I didn't hear you. What'd you say? I seriously didn't hear so I'm glad you threw my pants on. Oh, yeah, no, I know. Just, it happened to us. We called our first buyer and said, hey, um, we've got an offer that's higher. We're not, don't freak out. We're not stealing it from you. We'd like to offer you $4,000 to not buy the house if you'll let us sell it to offer B. Does that sound good to you? Do you accept or not? Otherwise, it's your house. No, 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 no questions asked. You have it under contract. It is your house. You intend to close. That's the buyer we've dealt with before. We do know them. Uh, which I would do that with anybody. So I've gotten, I've personally gotten paid five grand to not buy a house because the same thing happened. Another buyer calls. Anyway, that's what I felt like was the right decision. Yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah that's awesome. well, Carlos and I were talking about that earlier. Going, yeah, no, that's happened to me before too. People were just like, ah, oh, sorry, you're not the higher bid bidder anymore. I'm like, well, what? We weren't bidding. I have a contract. It's <laughs> <laughs> a bid. It's a different deal altogether. Uh, and I do take the first actual offer that I get. Generally speaking, that is above my acceptable range, right? And I mean, you, you look at it as a decision: yes. do you want it in short term or in long term? People who just worry about short term mess up their relationships. <coughs> people want to win long term, do the right thing. Well, that's my favorite. I'm going to take your five grand and not buy a house. My favorite deal ever. <laughs> my question is: um, I have a couple properties, and I'm getting ready to put them on the market. They are, right now are multi, um, multiple. Family units, but they're also multi-use zone. 
but two of the units have it to where utilities are included. So my question is, how likely are you to buy that type of property where utilities are included? In a residential rental, as it is now, but again, it is multi-use. I mean, it's just cash flow for me. I mean, I have, I've never done it on the commercial side, but I definitely have bought a residential, I own like this, like these two town houses, they're like together, it's like a duplex, not a duplex, it might be a duplex, I don't know. Um, but when I bought it, the, the person who I bought it from was paying the sewage and something, I don't even know what he was paying. And I kept the tenants and all that stuff in place because the cash flow was just stupid on it. You know, and, I, and so my admin then takes our, our payment, just makes the, the payments. So it's just a cash flow thing. Okay. So it depends why. Like for for him, <coughs> is if like one person didn't pay it, both of them were affected or something, and, and he dealt with stress of not them not paying the bill, and then this just the nightmare. So it was better for him to get an extra hundred dollars a month in rent, pay the utilities himself, and then just kind of deal with the headache. What about the rest of you guys? I hundred percent agree with him. I have a tenant right now that's the same way, and he just didn't want to deal with the house. So I was like, all right, your rent is that much more each month, and we rolled with it. And I'd have no reservation buying that property. If so it's not that big of a deal for us. What we have done is, is we, if there's like one utility, the bolt units or a few units, we, we just charge them an extra fee, a flat fee. And then also we, we really monitor their water usage. And I and I know that sounds kind of bad, but you know if we go in there and we, we see that the toilet's running or things like that, we, we fix it right away. Because that's not fair to, to us. Just one toilet running will cause you to not. Thank you. When you all started, was the goal to, you know, where you are now, like, how that, how that process was about when you bought the first duplex? Well, when you first got a duplex, then it was like, you know, try to pay that off, this is how the triplex, and, you know, a little bit bigger unit each time. Well, enough money to be able to, for not pay it off, but have enough money for down payment for the next property, you know, got out of the duplex. We saved up money for down payment out of the rent from the first one. Basically, to so have enough down payment to buy next property, have enough down payment to buy next property, just did a lot of loans. Yes, yeah, so our, our first one was, was, was a home equity line, and then I think our, our next one also is a home equity line cash. And the following one, we did get a loan on the property side to get it And then after that, then we get a loan on the property side. Okay. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. 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 Y
have to stay on top of it. You know, a lot of the property management companies, I don't know if there's anybody in here, but I haven't had any good experience because they, you, that's again the deals we bought, 30% occupied, because they were you know, managed by the uh, management companies instead of the owners. So most of our deals we bought were like 30, 40%, 20% occupied in a bigger apartment complex. That's a lot of units. 30% off. 150 units is quite a bit. So you got 70% vacant. So that's a lot of units. So, but you need to go in and do repairs and renovations on those. That's a big deal because you will be turning off the water often for the whole complex. You get calls nonstop, <laughs> and then you get people, all this stuff, push on media, and all this other thing. Yeah. yeah, I mean, there are a lot of yeah. bigger yeah. things. I guess I can't stress enough the comment that Brandon just made about having a partner. Um, those of you that are looking to get into this type of business long term, um, use this time as you're prepping to build relationships within the community. See how people do business. Um, make connections with good plumbers, good trades people, the kind of folks you can just pick the phone up and say, hey, let me brainstorm this thing. I think it's under a transformer. You ever seen that? You know, just dumb, dumb stuff like that, but stuff that's going to be a real real example and you know like for me I found a partner who was a contractor for 20 some years you know and had strengths that I did not and so us together really can accomplish much um, so I don't know if that that helps but that's a huge point yes ma'am um, so for those who don't know my background is um, in commercial real estate I was an accountant and a property accountant and for a commercial real estate firm here and a part of what I like to do in the Columbia Wire and just even when I'm talking to any small business owner but particularly in investing as people are talking about rentals commercials everybody wants to own and jump in the game but they don't have their financials in order rent rolls and I noticed a change when I came from um, commercial real estate we had to do financial statements every month the banks I mean on demand we had to produce rent rolls information for multiple years you know and then in residential you run across owners who just kind of haphazardly have financials they don't take them as seriously and then as a wholesaler we're like yay we got this deal and then our buyers are like where's the financials where's these legitimate rent rolls and there's a big drop off in how seriously um, I guess especially in residential how seriously they take their financials so if you all could speak to just how important whether you're a wholesaler whether you're a landlord whether you're getting in commercial how important it is to have accurate up-to-date financial statements and records because a lot of times that's where deals fall apart when you don't have your financials in order yeah I mean I, I would say as a, as a lender as someone who you know, has been on both sides of that if you're gonna get in this business you have to decide is this gonna be a hobby or is this gonna be something you're gonna go all out at if there's any inkling in your mind that you said this is something I'm gonna go all out at operate like it's a full corporation that you own you know keep those personal financial statements as, as get it was it may seem you know to put that thing together together um, you know itemize that thing out really pay attention to it know that so when you do have a deal of a lifetime which typically happens in a, in a crunch time you know your numbers and that will separate you from all those other people that you just saying um, so that's that's what I would say and if you need help I mean get a good tax planner you know pay the extra money to have someone that knows what the heck they're doing if you're gonna have your first rental property or whatever they'll save you more money in your first year than you paid them to, to do your your tax plan yeah, for and then, sure and then from like the wholesalers perspective um, I've definitely been burned and, and, and been in awkward situations where I wholesale houses in the beginning didn't know the details tenants were in place and I felt bad because the buyer you know and they could have done due diligence as well but to me you know they got the deal for me and trust uh, and so from like a wholesaler's perspective get as much proper information about the property as you can from the, the owner um, so what we did in our company like I have an inherited tenant sheet um, and if there's a tenant the sheet goes out I want to know what comes with the house was there a security deposit was there not a security deposit what how's their rent and I want that signed by the tenant and I want it signed by the owner um, I can do the tenant later if needed, um, but but there's nothing worse than you get there and like, well, where's my thousand dollar security deposit? Oh, I don't have one. I'm keeping it. And then like and the, and like I've seen deals almost blow up at the table because you think that you as 
buying something as a, a landlord, you're going to be getting ten thousand dollars in security deposits if you're buying a portfolio or something like that. All of a sudden, you don't have that. You know, now me as a, as a landlord, I have no protection. I have these tenants. I have no security deposits to go back on. Um, so as a wholesaler, get your due diligence. Get the lease. Let us see the lease. Understand, um, you know, the rents. A lot of owners aren't going to have like a true rent roll unless they use a property management company. I can call Jesse and say, hey Jesse, give me my rent roll for Hope and he'll give it to me. Um, but a lot of people don't do that. They use receipt books and things like that. Right. So just try to get your hands on the leases and then add value to the buyer. Create your own rent roll. Get on an Excel sheet. When did they make their payments? Pull out your inherited tenant form. <coughs> I want the tenant's name, phone number, email address, um, emergency contact, like all these kind of things so that when I buy the property it's fluid for me to to then go do it. And that's when like your landlord people are gonna be more apt to buy properties from you because you've done the job, you've earned your assignment fee, you've, you've done those pieces. Um, and then you from a landlord buying from wholesalers, get that shit too. Like don't, don't just buy and be like, oh wait, they just moved with the stove. Oh yeah, the owner told me I could take the stove because I did this. Okay. Yeah, you know, and there's nothing you can do about it. They're out, so it's gone, and it does happen. Um, you know, so my sheet says fridge, check, yes, everybody signs it, and then I have something to go back on. Uh, and I'm more than happy to share the sheet if anybody wants it. Um, email me, I'll send it to you. It's got my branding on it. You can just take it off. But uh, it's nothing. It's nothing secret. It's just something that helps us stay in line. Um, can we leave your branding on it? I mean, sure. Take it. It'll make you think of me first. <laughs> About the finances, I would say that, that that's really critical. That that for us, and that that's I think what separates the uh, average investor from the, the great one. Um, it's like we, we have everything like planned out to the T, and I think that if you kind of incorporate it with your life plan, it may sound a little corny, but incorporate it with your life plan and have exact details of what you want to do and read about it a lot. I, I think you know it would be definitely successful. And we have like monthly, we have like monthly financials. Like every month, I know exactly how much we made. And it's not just the QuickBooks reports. You just look at your your bank balance and see how it's changed. Because you know a, a, a lot of things change when you when you look at you know property reports. Um, so seeing how your bank balance changes and looking at your cash flow is critical. And having those goals is is really important. I was gonna say because as a buy and hold investor, commercial, residential. You're not just looking at the P&L, you're looking at your cash flow statement as well. Yeah. Like both of those things. Yeah, cash flow especially. And like, you know, our, our property tax expenses is a lot, so we have to allocate for that. If we don't, then we're, we're in big trouble. So, in December, you're going to have a problem. Yeah. <laughs> so, um, yeah. But really, I think the, the financial, that's what I was saying about the low cap rate and high cap rate, the sooner you do that, the better you're going to be. And, and if you want to be wealthy and you want to do that stuff, to, like to Peter's point, treat it like that in the beginning. Mm -hmm. You know, I did my first personal financial statement a couple months ago and there wasn't a damn thing to put on it. <laughs> but it was fun doing it. I mean I had a couple assets, it wasn't that bad. But you know, it but the point is like I have it built now. So now when I buy assets I add them to my personal financial statement. So when the bankers call me, hey, hell yeah I got it. It's on my Excel sheet. I keep it updated because that, I'm working my way towards it. Now I'm not a millionaire yet. No, I don't have liquid reserves of all this stuff, but I'm not gonna get it if I think that I'm not gonna have it. You know, and don't wait till you, to Peter's point, don't wait till you, you need that refi or you need that whatever it is to cash a private investor out to then start putting that stuff together. Um, you know, treat yourself like the person that you wanna be. Um, and I think that's really important. Sometimes a good good old fashioned Excel works too. You know, That's all I, mine. Mine's just an Excel sheet. I started with an Excel. Yeah. Uh, he's fancy, you know, he likes to do the proper software and PL and all that fancy things. I still use my my Excel. I mean we'll have the same information. He'll have one of his things, but I love to see my Excel because that's how I started, you know, 15, 20 years ago. I still love that, you know, so nothing wrong with the yeah. basic. That's all. My my personal financial statement is an Excel sheet. <laughs> My banker made it for me, so it's nice. Yeah. <laughs> um, I just wanted to ask Brandon and Angela, at what point uh, do you, because I don't know if you guys are still managing your, your own properties, or at what point do you think that you need to go to a property manager? That's when you become excited? Yeah, <laughs> I manage my own properties. So I come, I come at it from a different perspective, um, and right or wrong, 
I don't want to manage properties and I want to pay people to be in their highest and best use. And I am not a highest and best use property management person. Ask Jesse. You know, I need him. I need, he's my crutch. Um, but to that point, I do say, and I recommend if you need a property manager in Columbia, don't hesitate to call Jesse. Um, but I, I do say that you need to understand it. You know, and so take it from, from experience for me. I bought a ton of rentals really quickly this summer um, and used third party property management to do it. And then the person that I had the relationship with, she ended up leaving, they replaced it, and it has been a nightmare. And I didn't know what to do, how to get through things, and how to, so now I've had houses that sat vacant for two and three weeks, um, that sh it, it just little things, and that stuff starts affecting your cash flow. And so I don't, I don't necessarily think it's a numbers. For me it's not, but I wanna know how it works. How do you lease up somebody? How do you how do you collect the rent? How do you pay attention to a rent roll? How do you manage the hot water heater going out Friday night at eight o'clock at night? Because once you know how to do it, then you can manage somebody else to do it. And that's with anything in your business. Um, and, and that's my perspective. But I've, I I have zero desire to be a property manager. But now I'm getting ready to fire mine in Augusta, and they're going to lose you know 30 assets. And so what I'm going to do this time is I'm going to go in and learn how to do it. And then, hopefully not for very long, but I'm going to learn how to do it. And then so when it is time to bring a property manager back in, it's going to be because I know how to do it, I know how to manage, I know what I'm looking for, and I'm set to then, to then you know, let them do their own thing. I certainly recommend know exactly what he said was know how to do things because people will rip you off like left and right. You know, I've had people, even my guy said one time that he would go out, do a AC call, spend four hours just chilling in, you know, at it, using the phone, <laughs> only replace a capacitor or some small part, which cost $10, but he would spend four hours there and charge four or $500 to a person. Mm. So as long as you know what things are, you can ask like, hey, what was wrong? This was wrong. Well, this doesn't cost that much money. You know, so you know what it is, so people can charge you five hundred dollars for something that shouldn't be. So the same point, same property manager in Augusta. They called me, hey, you want your hot water heaters out? Send me a thousand dollar bill. <laughs> and uh, luckily, I caught it before they replaced it. And I was like, hell no! And I called my my, my uh, contractor in Augusta. I was like, hey, you want to go buy and put a hot water heater for me for three three hundred fifty bucks, four hundred bucks, whatever, to buy it and put it in. You know, that's sick. That, that's six hundred bucks. That that's your cash flow for a. That's a lot of cash flow, you know. And and but you wanna, um, you wanna not do it. like I just got a. They email me today. I got to put a new HVAC in. I thought the bill was high, so I said let me, let me figure it out, and then I'll call you tomorrow. And I have some HVAC people. Uh, but if I didn't know to question that a thousand dollar hot weed for water was high, yeah, sure, go for it, you know. And so I I, I think having the knowledge there is really important. Right. Try uh, what you should do also if you. Even if you're going to manage it yourself, you should, uh, when you do your spreadsheets, you should add in a, add in a property management of 9% or 10% or something like that. And even if you're not paying someone that, if that property doesn't work, if you had to pay a property manager, then it's not a good deal. You know what I mean? Uh, because you know maybe right now you can do it yourself, but what if you get uh, what if you get sick? You know what if you get uh, you know you're hospitalized or something? And your, you know, your wife or your other siblings or whoever else, you know, they're not, they don't want to do that. You know, all of a sudden you're in a, you're in a bind. You know, so you should at least, when you run your numbers, even if you're going to manage it yourself, budget for a property manager because one day, especially if you, you know, it's easy to manage, you know, let's say ten houses or less, uh, but once you start getting more than, you know, like ten houses, especially if you're working a full-time job too, uh, even if, I mean. It's just uh, you should budget for the property manager because one day you might just say, you know what, I want to go on a vacation for the next month or two, and I don't want to be dealing with all these calls. So just budget for it, even if you're not gonna. Uh, and if you are gonna manage yourself, there's some good, there's some really inexpensive properties out. Like you don't need to go to Buildium and do that kind of stuff. Like I think you can use Cozy.co, um, Yardy Breeze is another one. I think they're like a hundred bucks, and then after that, it's a dollar an asset. Um, Buildium. Well, I'm not. So, uh, but yeah, I mean, there's some there's some really good stuff out there uh, that you can use to manage it to help you with your uh, numbers.
course, uh, I want to mention back on the good part when you're making your investment into your property and you know abs absolutely put in that number of the uh, the cost to manage it because in the end game is always at some point you're going to get out. So if that number is not in there, it's not a sensible uh, investment if, it, if that number is not in there and it doesn't work. You know, if it's not in there. And it, if it's in there and it doesn't work, then it's not a sensible investment. At some point, you have to get out of it. And if you're going to be losing money to get out of it, is that really a sensible when investment? When you're selling, if buyer is going to add in that number for that's that. Right. Yes. So make sure you're always out of the number. It's, it, that's extra profit for you, because, but it's actually what you're paying yourself. It's, it's you know, and you're not, you don't really work for free. Your, your money is making that first bit of money, but you're actually you should be paying yourself the property management side. And the... Um, and then when it comes to repairs, also if you're going to buy them and manage them, just because the AC works doesn't mean don't factor in an HVAC. Just because the roof's not leaking, don't factor in an HVAC. Because I have bought houses and then the next day condenser are gone. And, and if, had I not prepared for that, and that's the hardest thing from like a wholesaler or from a buyer to talk to a wholesaler, I get that it's cold of the house right now. But it's a 15 to 18 year old unit. Like I can't bank on that thing being good for you know, the lifespan of the, the property. And so like you as a wholesaler, understand that. Um, and then from a buyer, if you're gonna keep it, just because it works, doesn't mean that you don't budget it. If it and that is, if it's a brand new one, don't budget it for something. But, you know, play it. For me, I want 10 years on my HVAC when I buy it. If it has, if it has less than 10 years left of life on it, I'm budgeting it in my right now. One thing I would recommend is uh, if you're planning to keep that house, maybe look into a home warranty. That has come in very handy for us. You spend like $400 for a year, but they will replace water heater or they will replace toilet sometimes, you know, or HVAC repairs. So that can come in very handy if you're not experienced with um, repairs too much. Invest in that $400 a year. If you're starting out, that was a good thing to do. They won't drill a hole in the property. Okay. <laughs> <coughs> it'll, it'll come in handy for HVAC repairs and water heaters. Or yeah, but with the uh, home warranty, they usually want to repair. They're going to repair, repair, repair before they put a new one in. Mm -hmm. As a property manager, I think those home warranties. But again, you've got to know what you're talking about. You've got to say the right thing. Get them to do the right thing. Right. Right. But if you don't know what you're talking about, then you'll walk all over the place and do very minimal things and cost a long time. Is that it? Okay, is that it for everyone? Any more questions? Um, with uh, seller financing, if you're trying to do seller financing with a mortgage, um, you know, who do you uh, contact to structure the, the deal? Like, who's the like attorney or real realtor or I mean, not a realtor. Not a realtor. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I, I would do I would do a real estate transaction at a period without without an attorney. You know, take is Brianna still in here? Yeah. Brianna can share a very wonderful experience of somebody somebody doing a lease option without a uh, oh, attorney. Yeah. Um, if you want to catch her offline. Very interesting. State law. Good question. Yeah, about the uh, going back to the private money part. What type of paperwork do you need to between you and the person that is in the private money? Is that the uh, attorney or is that certain paperwork that you do or how does that happen? You mean when I'm borrowing money from a relative? Oh, yeah. <laughs> anyway, um, I have, well, I guess I've got some forms now that I've been using over and over again. So I'm trying to remember where I got the first one. I think I got it from one of those uh, speakers who came around and, and did a class. But, um, so. but I had it blessed by an attorney. <laughs> Definitely had it blessed by yeah, an attorney. That's sort of changed over time. It's different it does change. It, it does. And that's, and that's another thing. I mean, I guess, I guess that there's one. Each mistake is a change in a form, right? Yes, it is. Yes, it is. Because there's certain clauses that are helpful to you that you want to include. So, yes, there, it, you're right. It absolutely does change every time. Um, but primarily a promissory note. Promissory note. Uh, Ken mentioned that a while ago. There, when you're buying a house, there's two documents. You sign a promissory note and a mortgage. Um, the promissory note is what indicates that there's a debt. 
indicates that there's money owed. So that is, you know, a legal document. I don't know why those are not recorded at, with the register of deeds or the courthouse. It doesn't make any sense to me. That's the one that's really the main piece of paper. So we always make sure there's one of those. And they have it on file. They have the original. I tell them to keep it in a safe place. So if anything ever happened to me and they needed to come try to collect from my estate, they bring that piece of paper and say, hey, it says she owes me money. You know, when I repay them for that for that loan, um, I have them satisfy the note on that original note. Paid in full and satisfied as of this date. They sign it. They send it back. They keep a copy, but they send it back to me. So I've got it closed out. And, that was all awesome. set. And that's important when it comes to, like, title issues. You yes. Don't, you don't want to not have something unsatisfied come up in title work and that issue. And what is like a good percentage as far as between you and the private as far as paying back? As cheap as you can get it. <laughs> That's a good question. You know, you know, you know it's weird because it's almost like people who understand real estate want a high number, right? People who under, understand real estate that are friends of mine that loan to us, you know, they want 10, 12 percent. Okay, my, my non real estate people are okay with six to eight. As a matter of fact, they get a little nervous if you offer them too high a percentage rate because they know the bank is paying them 0.0 something and they think if you're offering them 8% or 10%, there must be something wrong. <laughs> there must be something crazy going on. That sounds too risky. So for people who are non-real estate people, you might start off at three, four, five percent. They'd probably be happy to get it. My goal is to make sure that people who loan us money are getting ahead of inflation and taxes and still growing their savings. So I, tr I try to go with about 8% for folks who are lending to us. And, and a couple things on it. Um, a, a good friend of mine said you have box money and you have bunny money. You know, depending on where you're going to go get the money is where you're going to pay for it. Um, so you come into real estate functions like this and you borrow money from investors who want to make money, you're generally going to pay more for it to her point. Like, but then you go to, to go to other people that, that aren't in this space, you get it um, inexpensive. Um, but don't cap yourself. Don't be scared. You get what you ask for. You know, I've paid as much as 15% to points to people. I've paid as low as 6%. Um, and so it just really depends on... What I, you know, because in the beginning I didn't know, I was scared, I was scared to ask for anything, and I was like, I, I want to make sure they make lots of money, and the deal was really good, um, and then I looked at their check, and I'm like, damn, you know, um, and so it goes to that, and then I think the second piece to it is the more money you have access to, the lower you can drive your rates. You know, when I first started, and I didn't have access to any private money, and somebody's willing to work with me, you know, I kind of took what I could get and made sure the numbers work. And then now that I have access to a lot more capital, if somebody's like, no, nah, I'm not going to take that rate, I'm all right, no worries, cool, I'm going to go make this phone call and get it over here, well, all of a sudden this person's money is not making them any money anymore. And their rate starts driving down um, to then do it. So there, there's a there's something said to be having uh, multiple lenders. Because I used to only have one lender and that was it. He made a ton of money off me. And then I realized if I have a handful of others out here, I can, I can start. Yeah, that's coming from me from the investor side. Um, I always find that the best best way is if the lender can make money and you can make money, everybody's happy. Yeah. You know, you don't want to get greedy where you're trying to make a ton of money and driving him way down because at the end, you want to make sure that he's going to lend you next time. But I the only reason I challenge that, though, is so, like, my company does, we'll do 140 transactions this year. And so if my private investor is in 80 of those transactions, he's still making money on the volume play of it. And so yeah. cost of capital is a big thing for us now because if I'm paying 12, 15%, and I do it over, I spread it over 80 transactions, 100 transactions, and I can drop that down to six or 8% or 4%, like that's a huge hit to our bottom line. I'm not and saying he has to make a ton of money. Yeah, yeah. That, you know, yeah they he's got to be happy yeah. with the money they're making, and you got to be happy about the money you're making. Yeah. Now, if you're doing all the work and you're doing all the time, you got to make more than they're making. But as long as they're happy with the money they're making and they're not going like, man, I wish I was making more money all the time, you could lose them as an investor. But if they're happy with the money they're making and you're still making what right. you make on your end, it's a win-win for everybody. And, and one private investor that people always forget about is the homeowner. The homeowner is the biggest private investor in any situation. 
they have a mortgage, or they own it free and clear, or they do things like that, and I know you're trying to get it as cheap as possible, give them an extra 10 grand to be your lender. Then you don't have to go borrow any money, or you don't have to go do these things. Um, and, and I'm just as guilty of it. I'm like, I want it cash, and I want to just not do it. Structure the deal with the owner. You know, hey, listen, I'll pay you a little bit of extra money, or I'll let you participate on the win, or I'll let you do some of these other scenarios, um, and let them do that. You know, because because if you if you break out like a like a, a owner finance deal, and you look at how much money you're going to pay at the end of the deal, depending on what you're doing, the price point, those kind of things, give some of that money back to the owner and say, I'll pay you a little bit more money, but I need this. Um, That was it. So um, I, I just prepared a little updated um, real estate report card for Richland County. Um, this is as of the end of quarter 2019, kind of where we're at. There's job stats on here. There's uh, you know, just a ton of different things that are specific to Richland County. The Lexington County numbers are really not too, too far off from this. But these are some great graphics you can share, you know, really any person in a transaction that's interested in real estate, hey, here's an updated stat that I have um, from, from a very um, good source that we partnered with um, called MBS Highway. Um, get a lot of alerts daily from them and so forth. So take that, and if you need extras or you want to drill into one of those stats more with me, feel free to reach out to me. All my contact information is on there. Yes, sir. Hey, I heard you say that your company is doing 140 transactions a year. How, how do you structure? <coughs> a business plan to project a number like that. I, I'm not very good at that part yet. We're still learning how to, you know, like we, we've definitely um, grown and fallen and grown and fallen. Um, it's just kind of what we're used to, to be honest, at this point. I mean, we started it, I, my background started with a hedge fund and we were doing a lot of off-market stuff with them. So we were just used to the volume. Um, and so we, have just that's just kind of the way we market um, and we, we have our ups and downs for sure um, uh, so for any of you other guys like how do you guys like have a structured business plan for just two deals or i heard yeah. you say you you guys were kind of meticulous how did you structure your uh commercial multifamily uh, so, so, so when, when we're looking at an offer transaction, we will calculate our, um, our net operating budget and have our income statement, and we'll draft out the loan payment, so we'll know how much we're making at a certain point. And then if we want to buy a property, we'll look at, you know, like, like at, that, at those financial properties we're going into, and we'll make sure that when they're going to make more money than they made before. But for the business plan, um, like if you're just starting out, you probably want to start reading more about the topic. A good book is um, by Matthew Martinez, two, two Years, Two Million Dollars in Real Estate. I like that one. Um, right in. And then, you know, and then after you get some experience, then, then, then you'll know more about the numbers, uh, and what areas, what kind of return you'll get, and then you can kind of form your plan based on that. And track everything. So like, we use EOS as a business model. Um, and they have what's called a BTO, Vision Tracking Organizer. It talks about you know 10 years, three years, one year, quarterly, and some of that stuff. And we use that in our business, um, for sure. But if there's anything I can recommend as a book, it's a must read for anybody. Uh, it's called Profit First. Um, it is hands down financially one of the best books I've ever read in my life. Um, and it and it talks it teaches you ways to take your profit immediately save it and do the right things with it and take like i'm in i'm in a national you know mastermind with people that have millions and millions of dollars in their business and that's kind of like the book that everybody's studying and teaching themselves right now because it, it, if you follow it and stick to the points it is a magical book especially for people who are just starting and you get that ten thousand dollar assignment that five thousand that fifteen thousand what do i do with my money you know, and it tells you in the book what to do with your money. And if you follow that, at the end of the year, your P and L will be in the green, and your profit will be in the green. And that's that's super important because there's no. I take it from me. I've I've done. I think the highest year we did like 1.5 million dollars in gross assignments and had no money left at the end of the year. And that doesn't mean I didn't get a paycheck, and that doesn't mean things didn't happen, but. We were we had marketing and we had education and we had all these things going on and we didn't we didn't 
funnel it the way we were supposed to, um, and it sucks. I guess it sucks to go to the end of the year, work your ass off, bring in millions of dollars, and then not have anything to show for it at the end of the year. Um, and it just went from being an inexperienced business person and not understanding, you know, budgets and things like that. Um, and that book is a really kind of high level, not really entry level way of just saying, here's what you do with your money, do these things, and just stick to it and don't touch anything else. You know, it's not going to say take this for marketing and this for that, but it, it, it's going to teach you the profit side of the business, which I think is um, instrumental. Okay, uh, I, I hate to spoil everyone's fun here, but uh, I want, this, this is a little past nine here. We should let our speakers get some sleep, but uh, I'd like to thank you all for, I mean, these are the experts. I mean, I'm a land amateur. Did anyone have anything else they'd like to maybe pass out to the peanut gallery here? No. Okay. Uh, Peter's the one that was prepared. He was prepared. Okay. <laughs> well, thank you again. I appreciate it. Hey, I know you all know residential people, but if you come across any wholesale commercial property, you can use the phone. Okay, the Tangries are buying a lot of commercial property. So, about Rick and, Rick and Mickey are still buying commercial properties, so even if you run into commercial, you know who to call. Okay? Thank you. Thank you. Is it okay? It's okay. All right. Let's let it run for a bit. Let's let it run for a bit. It's okay. Right. I'm glad you can make it better. I wanted to sell him. Alex English. He sold it off. And his, you know, his sister works for Richard McCann. I didn't know that. Yeah, he's got a couple of rows. Let me tell you how I met him. Several years ago. He was uh, working with his neighbor Nuggets. He was on his way to the airport. He stopped by an ATM and the neighbor was lost. Left his ATM card in the machine. So I go up there and it's like, hey, don't say that. So I call the operator. So she uh, found this number that she called us home. My wife was there. Told her to get some money from me. We met up and I gave her a card. She gave me a big fruit basket. And it was a serious thing. So that, that's my money. And then I saw him in the grocery store. 